Let's stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, Mr. Brennan. Honorable Mayor Ron Shaver. Here. Council Member Dan Marler. Here. Christine Casto. Here. Allison Howe. Here. Clint Anderson. Here. Lisa Northrup. Here. Kevin Lindell. Here. Okay, first item on our agenda is recognition of Mike Kirkendall as employee of the quarter. Mr. Wells and Mr. Curtis. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll start out and then I'll turn it over to Mr. Curtis to say a few things uh, if, if he wishes to. I'm sure he will. Uh, we would like to recognize uh, in front of the council and community tonight, uh, Mr. Mike Kirkendall, who is our uh, chief building officer. Uh, previous to that, he was our uh, building inspector and he still does a lot of building inspection. Um, Mike has been with the city for a long time. I won't tell you how long, because I don't know if that's rude or not, but uh, he's been with the city for a long time and he's done a lot of different things within the city. Uh, he's been a fire chief. Uh, he, he's a, a retired volunteer firefighter for the city of Fort Morgan and he has worked for the city as our building uh, official now for uh, I think two years or three years as the building official. Two years. Uh, some of the things that uh, were in his nomination included that uh, he's just always been a consistent worker and making sure that he does the best he can at, uh, with customer service in meeting the goals of the city, which are positive communication, and I can attest to that. Uh, Mike always has positive communication. Um, well, maybe we don't always, always have positive communication as individuals, but I've never heard Mike say anything negative. Um, and he's very uh, respectful in, in uh, working with other people within the city. Uh, even at times when people may not be respectful to him, he still uh, shows respect to others. Um, and of course, customer service. Uh, very few complaints about how Mike handles the situation. Uh, you know, it's hard to tell people they can't do something. Uh, it's not always a fun job to say you're not, you can't do that, but Mike has a good way of doing it, telling people you can't do it that way in a way that they can understand and uh, is very good. And he leads by example. So um, I'd like to present Mike with a few things. So I'm gonna come out here. And actually, um, Brad, did you have anything you wanted to add real quick? Jeff said it all. <laughs> that was easy. <laughs> Obviously, me and Jeff are big talkers. Mike's very yeah. silent, so it works out very well. He's an excellent listener, and I think, as Jeff mentioned, um, okay. his customer service and being able to listen to contractors and their concerns and those kind of items is really uh, priceless and invaluable, and we appreciate what he does for the building department. And uh, he's doubled his staff from one to two, um, thanks to um, the budgets to have uh, Mike Hozier on board under him. And I know that's helped him um, spend a little bit more time in the office and uh, get things done as well. So we appreciate it. So we'll present you with the picture that you get to take home, put on your wall or in your office. <laughs> uh, and obviously we get the, the standard, uh, your supervisor has a, a gift for you as well as uh, you get $100 gift card and a certificate for uh, your achievement for employee of the quarter. I want to thank you and all your hard work. Thank you for the for He is a man of few words at times, but we'll turn it over to him if he has anything he wants to say. It's all yours, Thank you, and I appreciate it. <laughs> Come on, Mike, you could talk more than that. It's like, nope. I'm out of here. <laughs> well, congratulations, Mike. I know I got to work with you. I can tell how long you've been here. <laughs> but do tell, do tell. I worked with him in the electric department when well, that was a long I was time in there. Ago. That was a while back. <laughs> but um, everything they've said about Mike is is right on key. Um, I've, I've had the pleasure of working with him over the years and. Very well deserved. Thanks for what you do, Mike.
Next, we have recognition of Michael Boyer for completing his Super Professional HR Certificate. That's what it stands for. Super Professional, Super professional HR, HR Certificate, HR that's, that's right. Uh, we'll let, we'll let uh, Michael correct us on what that is, because I know it's something else, but that's all I could come up with. <laughs> that's not true. It's, it, um, what, I'd, I'd like to recognize Michael Boyer tonight. He is our uh, Human Resources and Risk, Manager, uh, Risk Management Director for the City of Fort Morgan. Um, he's been with us for several years now and has done an exceptional job, I think, of uh, looking at safety <clears throat> and helping with the, promoting the safety program. Uh, we'll have good news again on that this year because of his efforts as well as the efforts of all the other employees. Um, Michael has certifications in both risk management and, and now the top certification is an HR professional. And uh, I wanted to recognize him tonight for his efforts to continue uh, in his education and learning and certification to enhance uh, his, <clears throat> his abilities and skills in his job, as well as making our community and our organization a better place. So uh, with that, Michael, I, I'll have you come up to the podium. I'll present you with a few things. <clears throat> And before I do that, I just want to comment. One of the things I really do appreciate about our directors is that they are all very much lifelong learners. They're always looking for opportunities to learn more and be better at their jobs. Uh, a lot of our directors go to continuing education programs to learn about the new things that we're trying to do in the city and to make sure that we're on top of uh, the game when it comes to what we do for our citizens. And so with that, uh, I got a card that just says, you know, nice job, thank you, I appreciate it. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> then got you a, a something to put on your desk. Sharon, help me pick it out. I'm not sure what it is, but it, it looks cool. Um, with your new, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a diamond with uh, your Very nice, thank you, I like that. And uh, we thought your wife probably deserved a, a, a night out, so we got you. Thank you very much. So what does SPHR well, stand we for? Seriously. It stands for Senior Professional in Human Resources. That wasn't too far off. No, no, <laughs> you're right there. Yeah. Thank you all very Congratulations, much. Mike. Thank you. We can go to his office and play and spin that, right? <laughs> Next, we have possible action by resolution on the reappointment of our airport advisory board. Uh, at our last airport advisory board meeting, we had uh, two standing members on the board, uh, Bruce Marin and Alan Doms, who have submitted their application for uh, serving on that board, as well as a a first time appointment for Beth Gleason for the airport advisory board. Uh, the airport, the board approved and made a recommendation to accept all three candidates. That will give us a full uh, board. You want to add something, Brad? Just wanted to make sure um, Beth is filling a vacancy for 2016, which is the remaining month, but it also is to for the starting in 2017. The other two are reappointments are for starting in seven. Yep. <coughs> Thanks. So I would entertain a resolution. Your Honor, I would offer a resolution on the reappointments of Bruce Marin, Alan Doms, and a new appointment on Beth Leeson to the advisory, the airport advisory board. Second. Second. Everybody wants it. <laughs> I have a resolution by Christine Casteau and a second by Allison Howe. Vote by roll call. That resolution carries unanimously. Next, we have a presentation of possible action on the application for fee waivers on the kind services for Christmas capital of the world, or the planes. Wow. Of the we will world. be the world. We will take that, too. Mr. Miller and... <laughs> We're getting there. Lynn's. Moving up. Mayor, Council, good evening. I'll turn things over here uh, in a minute to Media Logic, who's <clears throat> kind of spearhead behind this effort and uh, a great partner in our annual campaign and event. Um, 
they drive the bus, if you will, and we try to support them where we can to make sure they have what they need. On the agenda, it highlights sort of in kind. Uh, staff's uh, reviewed this. We don't really see a whole lot of fees associated with the event requiring any sort of waiver. So we're going to transition with sort of an update on what will be occurring at this year's uh, campaign or, or activities that uh, will begin here next week. Just a few things. I know you guys have a schedule in front of you, but a few things we wanted to highlight was that Snowzilla would be would be back. So we appreciate you guys' help with that last year, and we're hoping that that will be just as big of a draw in the uh, in this coming year as well. Something else we're looking to change a little bit. If you remember last year, we were looking to develop some sort of a lighting display at Riverside Park and incorporate that as well. Something we've asked Josh and his staff to put together is uh, decorating and getting fresh cut Christmas trees and having those decorated. So plans are kind of in the works to be able to do sort of an outdoor vision of trees display and eventually add more and more trees. We've had a lot of interest in people wanting to come out and do that. So that was something else that we were looking to add this year. Um, other than that, um, events on Thursdays and Saturdays, um, we've had a ton of support by businesses, community members, things like that to help with events again this year. And uh, I hope Jeff is working on his chili recipe because if I recall, you came in third last year? <clears throat> I did, I did, but <laughs> he remember came, three he years in, in a row fourth. before that, I came in first, <laughs> so. He, he came in fourth last year, I came in third. <laughs> wow. All right, Jason, all right. Jason. <clears throat> yeah, I didn't have my kids down there to vote, so. <laughs> Other than that, we're off and running and, and planning, so were there any questions of us for any of this year's activities? Is it true that there's only one Snowzilla in North America? There's only one company that provides anything like it, yes. And I have spent a lot of time making sure that's true, and it, it appears to be. <laughs> so, yeah, it should be the only one. That is awesome. Yeah, the, the company is out of uh, Massachusetts, and they truck it in. They have a distribution center in Dallas. So I think it's driven from Dallas and delivered to us. Yeah, and it's really exciting. cool. It's very exciting. Please thank the sponsors from all of us. We will. Who <clears throat> oversees or works Snowzilla? <laughs> Media Logic, and then this year we put together a, a schedule of volunteers and reached out to Lions Club, to uh, Hampton Inn had volunteered last year, to Roots Group. There are a variety of people that showed a lot of interest in helping us, which had to be 18 years or older, and we've sent out a calendar and asked for a little more staff. There were some days we weren't quite staffed enough last year for the demand that we had. So we've asked different organizations and groups to help us out. So where would somebody go to volunteer or where would they look to volunteer to um, help with that? Christmas Capital's Facebook page or I can send some info out to your guys' um, team through the city or just contacting our office. Okay. And we'll set up a schedule that we put out for people that volunteer. Okay. So yeah, we'd love to have you <laughs> or anybody. <clears throat> yeah, because last year when I took my granddaughter there that guy was helping, and he was really slow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's wow. a process. We all had sore limbs for several weeks afterwards. We were, we were made to be up on that every single day. We found out. We've had a lot of interest in helping, though. So, yeah, anybody okay. can contact us, and we'll sign them up. Okay. Thanks. Anything else for me? Another good year. The schedule looks great. Thanks. I would entertain a resolution for approval of the fee waivers for in-kind services. Your Honor, I would offer a resolution for a fee waiver and in-kind services for Christmas Capital of the Plains. Second. Second. I have a resolution by Lisa Northrup and a second by Christine Casteau. Uh, vote by roll call. That resolution carries unanimously. Next, we have presentation and possible action by resolution on the acceptance of our electric rate study and request to set the rates for hearing for December 20th on any proposed adjustments to our rates. Mr. Wells, Nation, and Mr. Krasky. Well, we'll go ahead and turn it over to Mr. Krasky, who uh, is our consultant and assists us with uh, our rates issues in the electric department. He's been doing that for a couple of years. Uh, he's done a very thorough uh, study uh, of the system and looked at some of the issues that we raised in the process, and he's here to present his findings and recommendations tonight. Thank you, Jeff, uh, Mayor, Chair, 
Members of the council, again, John Kraske, I appreciate the correct pronunciation because as I, I've always said, it, it's pronounced exactly the way it looks. Um, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, I'm here to talk about the electric rates. Um, I, will, I, I was noting when they were doing the employee appreciation, I see a lot of those at city council presentations that I do, and I've never gotten a, an, an applause for a, a rate presentation, and, I, and I, I'm okay with that, I really am, because <laughs> uh, I usually am delivering bad news. But tonight, uh, I think as you've, if you've gone through the presentation, I think you'll see that uh, Relatively good news, I think, for your customers, and I think it's an indication that you're doing some very good things here. Um, Jeff's doing a lot, a lot of good work in his relationship with Mead, and I think you'll see that reflected in the rate proposal here this evening. Purpose of the study, this is just general uh, information. Uh, I, I was retained. I've been, uh, I think, doing work for the city for about three years now. And uh, I think this is the second full rate study we've done. We've also done some pass-through adjustments uh, to, to pass through power costs changes from your power supplier. Now, the, the goal of any rate study is to, we want to develop rates that reflect the cost of service. Um, when I get to the back of the presentation, I'll talk a little bit about legal requirements. You have a legal requirement under Colorado State statute to establish rates that meet certain standards. This rate study and these rates that I'm proposing will meet those standards. Um, in addition to the legal requirements, we want to make sure that your, your rates remain competitive with neighboring utilities. Um, the second one's an obvious one. We'll make sure you have enough money to pay your bills. Um, if you, and you've done a very good job. You're, you have a very financially solid uh, utility, electric utility. And then the last one helps reflect, the, make sure that each of the customer classes is paying what they should uh, for, for their electric service. The last item on this, on this agenda was a new one this year. As you know, uh, one of your larger customers is in the process of developing a cogeneration plant. And that cogeneration plant essentially would use, uh, create steam that would use, they would use in their processes, but as a byproduct of that, there would be electricity produced. And it would supply a large portion of their needs. Um, the city has to protect itself because it still has facilities there uh, that are providing service when that cogeneration plant is not operable. Um, and also to be able to provide power supply for mean uh, during those periods as well, because no power plant can run 8,760 hours, 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. I, I say 8,760 because that's a common utility hour. That's number of hours in a year. And math thing, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Engineers. Um, <laughs> But there, there is no power plant capable of running 24-7 throughout the year. When, the, when their cogen is down, they're going to lean on your system. They're going to use the transformers. They're going to use power from me. And we want to make sure that the rate that you charge them for that service recovers your uh, cost of serving them. So that, that's, a, that's something that, that I haven't done for you in the past because there's been no need. But I'll go through that process and the rate that we have established for that. This is just a listing of some of the factors that are going into the rate change. I will say the biggest um, change uh, uh, that's reflected in these rates are those first two items. Um, ever since I became involved working with the city on electric rates, uh, Jeff has worked very hard um, to point out some, I'll, I'll call them inequalities or some inconsistencies. Inconsistencies. There's, that's a great word. Um, <clears throat> I was going to use a stronger word, but with a lawyer here and being on TV, I didn't want to do that. Um, that, that frankly, Fort Morgan is probably paying more than it should have been paying for power, and that had gone on for quite some time. Uh, there had been changes in the market and changes in the way mean uh, costs were incurred, and Jeff fought. Uh, I think fought is a fair word, uh, along with other members in Colorado that were probably on the short end of that stick, uh, to make sure that the rates were fair going forward and mean recognized that there were some inconsistencies in the rate and went established a 30-month transition mechanism where that inconsistency was going to end. And because of that, Fort Morgan's rates for mean have gone down over the last couple of years. And we'll, we anticipate going down one more step um, in April of this coming year. And that is the biggest factor that, got, that went into this rate study. Um, as, you'll, as we get to the next few slides, if you've gone through the materials, you'll see. Um, those costs go down, and, and 
the way your rates are set up, you pass those costs through to your customers. So um, we'll talk about what we're planning to do there. Um, Means doing a lot better financially as well. Uh, they had a management change about a year ago, and a uh, year and a half ago now, I guess, 18 months ago. And, and I will say that the, the financial performance there has improved uh, pretty significantly to the point where they distributed some revenue to customers and they're not anticipating any significant rate increases in the near future. So those are all good things that help your customers and, and, um, and I will be reflected in the rates that we put together here. Um, talk about rate components here a little bit. You have the way your rates are set up, you have a power supply rate and then you have what we call the base rate or the energy rate and the base rate. Uh, the base rate is everything except for what you buy from me and WAPA. WAPA, Western Area Power Administration supplies hydropower to you. You essentially pass the costs of your energy from me and WAPA through to your customers on a dollar for dollar basis. Uh, you don't change the rates every time their rates change, but you have a deferred energy account where you track how much uh, their costs are and how much you're passing through to customers. The other component is the base rate, and that covers the cost of the power lines, the, the, the lines in town, the transmission loop you have around the city, uh, cost of sending out a bill, cost of having administrative expenses, and, and the cost of capital improvements to make sure that your system is, is in good shape. Uh, I'm, I'm talking to Doug, last meeting we were out here, I understand you're in the process of rebuilding part of your transmission loop, which is a great investment, and it's 35, 40 years old, needs to be done. And, and so we have to make sure the rates are set adequately to cover those costs as well. And again, pass through any energy rate changes through that deferred energy account. With the changes in the mean rates and uh, with other expense factors, um, what I projected for fiscal year 2016, which is, will be coming to an end um, in about two months, or about a month, um, we had a deficit of about $460,000. Going forward to next year, though, with that reduction that MEAN is projecting, we're looking at about a, that deficit will decrease from about a half a million to about 34,000. You have enough cash to cover that shortfall over the next year or so. Um, actually, there won't be much of that, but um, going forward, one thing that um, is of concern is we've tried to make, keep the rates as stable and low as we can. Um, we will probably, we're going to, this proposed rate change will build in a little bit of a surplus just to make sure your, your reserves are replenished and to ensure you have enough money to pay future capital improvements. So with these changes, what happens in fiscal year 2018, actually 2018 will be the last of the, the big phase out of the mean rates. So in 2018, we actually predict, predict, project a surplus. And we project those surpluses will continue through 2020. So any questions on that? The one factor that um, I want to point out too though is even though power supply costs have gone down, uh, you still have expenses locally that need to be incurred. As Doug, as I pointed out earlier, you're looking at rebuilding part of your transmission loop. You have distribution lines that need to be maintained. Uh, last time I was here for a meeting, one of the uh, topics of discussion was uh, line, salaries for uh, your linemen. I'll just say this in, in, my, in my workings. I think across the across Colorado, Nebraska, Kansas. I think one of the biggest challenges municipal utilities face is retention of talent, uh, especially for those technical folks, electric linemen. I think you've done a very good job of being proactive with that, making sure that your salaries are competitive. I hate it when I see a city I work with that says, you know what, we need to save a buck or two on these linemen. And what they turn into is a training ground for the local co-op or for the local investor-owned utility. You get all the headaches that come with training that guy, and then when, he's, when he journeys out, he leaves town, or he stays in town and works outside of town. And I, I think you've done a very good job of maintaining competitive salaries for that, and there's a cost with that. I think the cost associated with that is, is less than the benefits you get from not having that turnover. You get more reliable service, you have safer employees. I think you've done a very good job with that, but again, that comes with the rate costs and the benefits are sometimes tough to quantify in reliability and safety. So with that, what I'm, I'm proposing is, although we are decreasing the energy rates, I'm proposing an equal offset 
in the base rate so that the extent the energy rate goes down, the base rate is going up by the same amount. <coughs> the way that works out is we'll have a base rate increase of about $444,000. Uh, about a third of that is being allocated to the customer charge for reasons I'll talk about here in a little bit. $298,000 will, will go to the delivery charge. That's the cost of using your lines to get the power there. Customer charge is every month that they pay the same amount. Um, the energy rate, we'll see a decrease of $444,000. And so when you look at the before rates to the after rates, the, net, the revenue is going to be about the same um, from your customers, just reallocating how we're collecting it and which customers we're collecting that from. Are there any questions about this? <coughs> That's a good thing because usually when that base rate goes up, the energy rate's going up too, and then nobody likes that, especially your customers. Uh, this is just a breakdown. Um, I always like to show this to show 72% uh, of your costs are directly related to power. That's, that's the amount you pay me and the amount you pay WAPA for, for power and delivery of that power. Uh, I like to see this number at least 70%. Um, in some cases, it's as low as 65% if they're extenuating circumstances. This is an, an indication that you are operating a very efficient utility. Um, that 27.8% even includes your uh, payment in lieu of taxes. I've seen some folks that say, well, you know, 80% of our costs are power, but then they put a line item on the bill that's the payment in lieu of tax and treat that as an off-budget item. So, you know, for you to have that kind of a percentage indicates you have a pretty efficient utility. And it's, you know, it's continuing to meet its obligations on the pilot and maintaining the system. Okay, with the cost of service, one of the big issues that I will say I've, I've encountered with the city's rates, and because we've had some rate changes in the past, we've tried to minimize adverse impacts on any rate class, but your customer charge is very low compared to a lot of your neighboring utilities. Um, I see customer charges anywhere from 15 to $20 a month, and yours is under 10, is less than 10. Um, the cost of service indicated that customer charge should be increased uh, more than the energy rate. So you'll see when I talked about earlier is about a third of the rate increase is being allocated to a customer co uh, cost charge increase. And it's very important that you have that set to an adequate level because if you have a, a low usage customer, and I'm thinking like a, a snowbird who goes to Arizona for the winter, even though it's been 80 degrees here, <laughs> um, their usage goes way down. and if you aren't collecting enough from the customer charge, you're not recovering the cost of sending out a bill, reading the meter, having the transformer and the service drop sitting there. So um, I'm suggesting a, an increase allocated more toward the customer charge than to the other classes. Um, that ends up in, increasing the rate more for residential, small commercial customers and actually decreasing the rate for industrial customers because they, don't, they have a lot more usage so a $10 customer charge on their bill is nothing. Whereas if your bill is $100 a month and you raise the customer charge $2 a month, then you, you're gonna have more of an increase. So the, the customer charge increase or addresses this cost, uh, cost of service issue we identified for residential and small commercial customers. I think it's appropriate and uh, in talking to, to Jeff and to Brent, uh, we're in agreement that this is, is a reasonable approach uh, there's some other factors that go into it. I won't bore you with the technical details on that unless you want to get into a discussion about solar and net metering, but I don't think you really want to do that. Because <laughs> you have way more exciting stuff on the agenda after me. So uh, residential customer, the typical residential customer will see an increase of about $2 a month with this proposed change. Your rates are still going to be competitive. And I love this chart here. This comes from the CAMU survey, which they complete every, uh, I think they complete it twice a year, if I remember correctly. Um, the red bars are the city of Fort Morgan. The one to the far left is your existing rates. The, the next bar over is the city of Longmont. They had the second lowest rates in the state for residential usage. The next bar over is what I'm proposing to increase your residential rate to with that customer charge increase. As you can see, my eyes aren't as good as they used to be. You're gonna be 16 cents higher than Longmont. I fully expect that they're gonna have a rate increase some point in the next couple of years. But if you look across the board, 
and you think about Fort Morgan and you compare yourselves to cities like Colorado Springs, um, Fort Collins, Loveland that are far larger, much larger than you, and your rates are still lower than all of those utilities, I think that's a testament that you're running a pretty good, pretty good uh, operation here. Um, and again, I think that, you know, like I said, you, you're not, and you're not doing it by nickel and diming your system, by neglecting your system. I've seen utilities that say, yeah, we have low rates. As you drive around town and you see trees that are grown into lines and you see wood poles that are about to fail, that's not the case here at all. So I think this is a testament to, to a very good operation. I your stewardship has done wonderful things for the electric utility here. Talk about commercial here. You weren't the lowest on the commercial, you were second lowest, but you will continue to be the second lowest in the state um, with these new rates. I would also point out these are most, these are all the municipal utilities. Um, if, you had, if we added the co-ops and the investor-owned utilities, then you'd still be very competitive with all those folks. So any questions on the rate comparisons with the recommendations? All right. Standby rate, um, just real quickly here, uh, as I talked about with, uh, with one of your large customers putting in Cogen, we want to develop a rate uh, for standby services uh, during their outages, their generation, make sure they're paying for your distribution system and the power supply that you provide them. They will self-supply most of their energy, but they will uh, in, at some times sell mean uh, surplus energy. Uh, we've got some other things we're working on in that. We're not prepared to present those to council yet, but this will make sure though that you're compensated for the facilities you have in place to serve these customers, to serve this customer. Essentially the rate approach, uh, they will pay a customer charge just as, as they do now. Uh, the distribution rate rather than being an energy-based rate as it is now becomes a demand-based rate. So we look at their highest demand on your system and they pay a rate that covers the cost of your distribution line, the transformer, everything that takes you to serve them along with the payment in lieu of tax allocated to them. Um, there's also a production component um, and that's based on them using your service 15% of the time. And that's based on typical outage rates for a power plant. You would expect that they're not going to, ex they're gonna be available at least 85% of the time. Uh, there will be outages for maintenance and for unforced outages or forced outages. Um, but if they, if for some reason they have a major catastrophic failure on their system and are on your system or are using your power for more than 1,300 hours, then you'll, you can charge them additional demand charges to reflect that. So um, this approach uh, is very similar to what XL Energy <coughs> uses. They have a standby rate for their customers that have this type of service. Uh, so they, this, this approach is consistent with Colorado Public Utility Commission standards and I think that uh, it, it would be, meet uh, the requirements that you have to make sure the rate's fair. Net impact of the utility, if they, when they start the cogen, convert to the standby rate, over the first year, your revenue should be about the same. Your net, rev your net revenue, less your power expense reduction, should be about the same, meaning you're still collecting the same amount you were for distribution, for customer service, and all those types of things. Um, so really, the reduction in revenue is going to be offset by a reduction in power supply costs that you pay mean. So we designed the rate to make sure that they're paying what, they're, uh, what they should be paying for distribution. Whatever goes reduced, whatever the power cost is reduced, their bill is reduced as well. And the rest of your customers are held harmless and the city is compensated for the facilities it has in place out there. Okay, any questions or comments on that? All right. Conclusions, overall existing revenue is adequate. Uh, we're going to, as I said, we're gonna shift the power, the recovery from the energy cost to the base rates. We're gonna have an increase in base rates of about $444,000 split between their customer and the energy rate. Uh, your rates are still gonna be competitive. That's a key point there. All right, regulatory overview. And this is mostly Jason's uh, area of expertise, so I just steal this from him. Uh, you are the regulatory authority for the city's rate. <coughs> You're not like an investor in a utility that has to go to Denver 
and apply it to the Public Utility Commission to have a rate change. You're the judge and jury <laughs> on this. Um, you have certain standards you have to apply. Now, the only way, reason you would ever have to go to the PUC is if you had different rates outside the city limits versus inside the city limits. You do not. Your rates are the same whether you're inside or outside and it's based on uh, what kind of class you are, whether you're a residential or an industrial customer. So there's no PUC approval. You would be the uh, entity approving these rates. Under state law, your rates must be just, reasonable, and sufficient. That's why you hire me to do a rate study, is I make sure the rates are sufficient, I make sure that all the rate classes are paying what they should be. Preferences are prohibited, and unjust discrimination is prohibited. But you have the, deter the authority to determine reasonableness on differences between rate classes. That's why we have an industrial rate and a residential rate. We've, you as a body many years ago decided we're gonna charge residential customers differently than we charge XL because they're different types of customers. And that's perfectly legitimate and every utility that I work with has those types of differences. Under state law, you're required to give a 30 day notice before you have a public hearing. Um, that's the reason I'm here tonight. I went through the results. I think there's adequate reason for you to make these rate changes because we're increasing the base rate. Um, there is a requirement that you give notice and have a rate hearing. So <coughs> I presented the rate report. Um, there is, I believe, a resolution. To, I'm, I don't know. I'll have to. I'll, I'll defer to Jeff. I think you have a resolution to uh, to set this for a rate hearing, and the plan is to set this for a rate hearing at your December 20th meeting. At that point, if there are no objections and there are no concerns, uh, the rate would go into, uh, would be approved by you all uh, with the rate schedules that are in your, in your packet. And January 1st of 2017 would be the effective date of that rate change. Did I get that all right, Jason? Yep. All right. Mr. Meyer. <laughs> all right. And that's it. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, I guess I'll be here when uh, Snowzilla is here on December 20th uh, for the rate hearing. Um, and if there are any other questions um, or comments, I'm happy to address those. Anybody have any questions for John? I, I just have one comment that I think is really important about our system. Public power is extremely beneficial to communities that own their own systems. Uh, when an, an investor owned utility, uh, such as Excel, uh, provides the electricity to your community, any of the excess funds or, or the amount of money that they can have on a return on investment goes to investors. Uh, the money that we have here stays here. Uh, the payment in lieu of taxes goes to benefit services within the general fund, um, offsets, administrative costs uh, for uh, the general fund as well as the other uh, departments. and. It is a huge benefit to the city of Fort Morgan to own our own electric system. And I think it's even better when we demonstrate that we do it in a very um, positive and um, efficient way. And I, I think really appreciate John's presentation tonight that demonstrates the value of, of this asset to the citizens of Fort Morgan. The other thing um, that I hear a lot of people who move into our community, they just can't believe how responsive the electric department is to issues that they have uh, at their house. Um, we've got great guys that go out, they know what they're doing, and they take care of our customers very well. Um, I, I would say that our, our service is better, um, our system is better than an, an investor-owned utility because we it's ours. It's, it's, it's part of our community and it benefits our community. So I think it's something that we need to be uh, conscientious of and proud of the fact that we're we're a public power provider. So I have a general <laughs> question. Um, you know, based on the the graphs and stuff and and the information, we obviously have a very uh, very affordable situation, very um, cheap considering. Um, we just deferred. Uh, or didn't defer, but we didn't, we opted not to go with a rate increase just recently. Um, you know, I know there are some concerns about people being kind of nickel and dimed to death 
Um, are we anticipating as a city any other increases down the road? Uh, I know we're waiting until after the study for the, the one that we... For gas. Uh, yeah. For gas, yeah. Uh, gas is the one we, we sent down. So are there, any, are there sewer, any other sewer. potential sewer. rate increases for any of our other utilities coming up that, that we need to keep in mind as we consider this one? That's a great question. They're all Thanks for separate coming up, enterprise funds, so they're all based as an individual business. So they're not commingled or co combined. Right, but for our consumers in the city. They get one bill. Yeah. Right, so I'm wondering, you know, in addition to this, are there others that we need to consider? Yeah, we'll, um, obviously electric is in front of you tonight. Um, we will be performing a new analysis on the, the water and sewer. We always do those together with the same rates consultant. And so hopefully sometime after the first of the year, we'll have conclusions from those. We anticipate there being an adjustment that needs to be made in the sewer fund. Um, the water fund, we'll just have to wait and see. We know with the NIST project as it moves forward, we're gonna have certain obligations to that. We've been trying to build in rates that will have us prepared for the NIST project when it gets here, so we won't have to make major adjustments. So at this point, I'll kind of leave judgment out on that until we get back to the, the rate study. The other fund would be the gas utility. Um, we haven't performed a full analysis um, in that one this year, but we did kind of a preliminary one. We always keep our consultant kind of in the loop of everything. Natural gas prices have stayed incredibly low and incredibly stable. And so we don't foresee any need to make any adjustments in the, the natural gas rates in the next year. So, but that's always market driven. And if we have any volatility in that market, we may have to come back. But at this point, the, the cursory look he did at the gas market would indicate that we're probably okay with our gas fund. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. So likely an increase in, in sewer and uh, possible increase in water, depending on what comes back in the study. Okay. If, if, I, forget. if I could add, you might, uh, in other communities that aren't uh, municipally owned, you might not see rate increases as often because it has to go through an entire public process put through the Public Utility Commission. <coughs> it's a lot more drawn out and complicated and expensive, so they don't do them as often, but the increases are typically a little higher. Here with the state regulations that we have, um, as Mr. Krause put uh, forth this evening, Briefly, we're not allowed to hold tons and tons of excess and revenues. We keep it uh, within reason. So that's why you see these increases more often. They do go down sometimes. Uh, I think we had that th two, three years ago where they go down as well sometimes. But that's why you see these on a more frequent basis, because the rules that govern us are different than the investor-owned utilities who go through this process on a less regular basis. So our changes might be often, but they're a lot smaller typically. Thank you. And you'll see Longmont, Fort Morgan, and Gunnison bounce back and forth, as John stated. They'll have an increase, so it's all usually those three that are on the bottom of the CAMU studies, has been for many, many years. So, um, are there any other questions of Mr. Krasky? Seeing none, I would entertain a resolution. Your Honor, I would offer a resolution accepting the findings of the electric rate study and requesting to set a rate hearing for December 20th on the proposed adjustments. Second. I have a resolution by Lisa Northrup and a second by Christine Castell. Vote by roll call. That resolution carries unanimously. I think we should clap for him, though. Because no. <laughs> <laughs> nobody ever claps for oh, rates, right? Clap for the staff. Doing it. <laughs> Thanks, John. Right, thank 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 you. Next, we have a presentation and possible action on an application for historic landmark designation for the property of. 228 and 230 Main Street, the First National Bank, the Curry Building. Mr. Miller. Good evening again, and uh, Chelsea's going to get a couple things set up, but uh, 
Chelsea and I have kind of taken a, a joint approach to historic preservation and with my schedule, um, she's sometimes more available than I am. So she's a little more familiar with these three applications than I, because I was not present at this meeting. So I'm gonna let her handle these next three. Good evening. Um, I'm gonna start with the pictures because I think those are everybody's favorite part. So for 228 and 230 Main Street, I'm just gonna scroll through these. These will also be in your packet as well. So the last one is where it is at today. Um, so the Historic Preservation Board recommends designation for 228 and 230 Main um, it is listed in the Historical and Architectural Survey of Fort Morgan that was completed by the Colorado Preservation Office. It's also associated with historic persons, uh, mainly the businessman and promoter James P. Curry, who is the president of the bank that was originally uh, located in the building. Uh, he continued to occupy the building after the bank's sale, uh, managing the Fort Morgan Loan and Investment Company out of it. Um, and then there was a whole uh, assortment of different things, including a smorgasbord, which I wanted to say just because it's fun to say. Um, but it is a two-story brick block building with a late Victorian classical revival style build, and it was built in 1907. So if there's any more questions, I'm sure Lynn would love to extrapolate on them. Questions? How many remember the smorgasbord? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Worth noting. See? Worth noting. <laughs> and they said the word again. <laughs> if there are no questions, then I would entertain. Action. Your Honor, I would offer a resolution on the application of the historic landmark designation for the property of 228 and 230 Main Street, the Fort Martin, the First National Bank Curry Building. Second. I have a resolution by Christine Casto and a second by Lisa Northrop. <laughs> the vote by roll call. That resolution carries unanimously. Next is action on the historic landmark for 116 West Railroad Avenue, the Patterson Hardware Building. So commonly known as the paint bucket previously. I'll scroll through these pictures. So the board also recommends the uh, designation of 116 West Railroad Avenue, known as the Patterson Hardware Building. It is as well in the Historic and Architectural Survey. Um, it's also associated with historic persons George M. and Robert L. Patterson were brothers who moved to town in 1885 and 1906, respectively. They organized the Patterson Hardware and Implement Company in 1907 and expanded steadily branching out into plumbing, contracting, and auto sales, among other things. Uh, they were also influential businessmen in Fort Morgan who participated in the usual array of financial, social, and political endeavors. It is a two-story brick building of the late Victorian functional style and was built in 1914. Um, and it now houses Tangles, a hair salon. These, these are for that building, correct? Were those added? Yes. yes, Your Honor. The additional photos in your packets are of this building. Building. Of the elevator, correct? <laughs> yes. So, for those that don't know, can you kind of explain what the historic landmark designation does for these in a nutshell? Would Josh like to speak to that? <laughs> he would. He's coming. He's ready. <laughs> he looks excited to speak about it, would he? We seem to have this conversation every time one of these shows up on an agenda. Um, for the ones watching that don't. Yeah. 
Um, you know, in short, it opens up. So obviously, it's a you know local designation. So um, I guess maybe there's some honor in that. The building still standing and highlights the local history. Um, there are some pieces above and beyond this that can be pursued at a state and federal level. Um, granting opportunities oftentimes require a local designation to occur. Um, there's specific criteria of which you should have in your packets, but the application has to meet certain portions of that criteria to be recommended to the board and then ultimately to council. Uh, currently, the city doesn't have any money budgeted, but there's always that option. We can pursue some budget uh, or dollars in the budget. That can be for matching grants or facade enhancements or whatever council might choose to pursue in the future, and that would ultimately require a local designation to be in place as well. Okay. Thanks, Josh. Does anybody have any other questions or such? If not, I would entertain action. Your Honor, I would offer a resolution accepting on the application for the historic landmark designation for the property of 116 West Railroad Avenue, the Patterson Hardware Building. Second. I have a resolution by Christine Castell, a second by Lisa Northrup, and vote by roll call. That resolution carries unanimously. And the last one is another application for a historic landmark for 201 Main Street, the Preston Block Building. And for the record, these are amazing pictures. Thank you for including them. Um, finally, 201 Main, known as the Preston Block Building. I think it's got one of the more exciting stories, which we'll get to shortly. But it is also on the Historical and Architectural Survey. And as Josh mentioned, those criteria that we're meeting are the criteria that I'm pointing out. So it has to be like on the survey done by Colorado Preservation, as well as being associated with a historic person um, and a specific type of architecture. So um, this building was associated, uh, well, actually, it was one of the oldest commercial buildings that's still remaining in Fort Morgan. And the first tenant to occupy the building was Morgan County Bank. Um, the president was an influential force in the town. And through his bank, helped direct the development of Fort Morgan. Um, it housed several things after that, like the Kreitz Drugstore and the Manhattan Restaurant with a rooming, um, rooming house above. And in this rooming house in 1916, a gunfight ensued in which the city marshal, Charles Iser and Maria Catherine Weimer, owner of the cafe, were killed by John Swan, who was a bootlegger, and he was also wounded. Swan was captured and tried. However, he escaped from the city jail and was never caught. Uh, the shooting incident enjoys a position of infamy in our town's history. Um, in 1944, the Clark Feather Manufacturing Company also occupied the building until 1977. Um, and then there's a lot of other information that um, our museum curator, Brian Mack, ended up adding into the application along those same lines. It is also a two-story brick, late Victorian functional style, uh, built in 1889. Questions, comments? Who remembers the gunfight? <laughs> we have a gentleman out. We have a gentleman out here that got very happy when he heard about the story. <laughs> See, it's the exciting one. Although the Schmorgus board was pretty exciting. I would entertain action. Your Honor, I would offer a resolution on the application for the historic landmark des designation for the property of 201 Main Street, the Preston Block Building. Second. I have a resolution by Christine Castell and a second by Lisa Northrup. Vote by roll call. That resolution carries unanimously. Thank you. Thanks, Chelsea. <clears throat> Next, we have a presentation of possible action on authorization for the mayor to sign a water exchange agreement. Mr. Nation. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, 
as your memo states, I was approached by um, Bart Ginther. He's a farmer between here and Brush. He's also one of the local pioneer seed salesmen. Um, he um, was in the need of some direct flow water out of the Fort Morgan Reservoir and Irrigation Company. And because of where this parcel of ground was located at, he needed shares that were unencumbered with a current lateral carriage agreement. And that's kind of hard in a ditch company to find something like that to shuffle around and use on the piece of ground that he had. But um, through previous interaction with the gentleman, um, he knew that possibly the city was a source for some of these shares. The city currently owns 130 plus shares in the Fort Morgan Reservoir and Irrigation Company. And we do have large blocks of them that are unencumbered by these lateral rights. And so when we started the discussions, it was, I didn't know if he was wanting to pay for it, but then he offered up in exchange the potential um, of just exchanging um, shares of the ditch company for shares in the Jackson Lake Reservoir Company. And so um, very interesting concept to do. Um, I liked it. We kind of ran through the numbers, brought it to you guys um, to kind of look at and give us some direction. And I think we got something worked out. Um, he's looking for nine shares in the um, ditch company. In turn, he will then, for those nine shares, will turn over three shares with Jackson Lake Reservoir and Irrigation Company. As I um, indicated in the memo, um, we currently use those nine shares in our plan of augmentation. We can use the Jackson Lake water in our plan of augmentation. It's a little bit of a misbalance for what it gives us, but there's a lot more flexibility with the Jackson Lake, so I'm comfortable in making that type of exchange. And as I also indicated with our um, project out the golf course going online next summer, the demand on our augmentation plan is going to be reduced significantly. And so I think the timing was good for this type of deal when he approached us. And so from my standpoint, the staff standpoint on this, I think it's a good deal. The only thing that he requested is we do have um, some shares that do have an attachment to the Fort Morgan Water Company Limited. And we as a city receive really no direct benefit for belonging to that company. I go to their annual meeting every year and listen to their presentations. It has more to do with the farmers and some of the obligations they have to the power plant out east of town. And so from my standpoint, it's okay to go ahead and, and transfer over those associated nine um, Fort Morgan Water Company Limited in this deal. We don't lose or gain anything by um, really owning those. So that was okay to include those. So, so at this point, um, if there's no questions on this agreement uh, or on this arrangement, I'm just looking for authorization tonight for the mayor to go ahead and execute the agreement that we have in place. Ginther has signed the agreement. The ditch company has actually already reviewed the potential exchanges. All the companies associated are okay with the agreement. So as soon as we could receive authorization from the council, we can move forward and go ahead and make the transfer if that's your guys' desire. So. Very good. So no money, just water for water. Water for water. <laughs> Our bucket for your bucket. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions for Mr. Nation? Sounds like a good, a good neighborly thing to do and you know it's win-win on both sides. And I think that's the other sides. part of this is it was you know we were able to help out Bart in this situation and it doesn't hurt us at all to do this and so. If there is no other questions or comments I would entertain action. Your Honor I would offer a resolution authorizing the mayor to sign a water exchange agreement. Second. I have a resolution by Lisa Northrup and a second by Dan Marler. Vote by roll call. That resolution carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Thanks, Brian. Next, we have presentation and possible action on a request to allow a message center sign. And I believe this ties with number 13 also. Yes, Your Honor. If I could clarify the two agenda items are same uh, folks looking t to get assigned two different distinct issues, um, but in that nature, I wanted to make sure council is aware some of the things that are brought up in agenda item number 12 may or may not be relevant to 13, so we'll kind of, um, when we get to the public hearing in the next agenda item, kind of incorporate these comments into that fact finding so that everybody's clear as to what 
decision or what facts you use to make any decisions that you make tonight. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, this request is to allow for a electronic message board um, greater than 32 square feet. Uh, in general, Chapter 20, Article 9 of the Municipal Code currently governs our sign regulations. Uh, the general purpose of this review is to determine compatibility of the proposed use with adjacent properties, surrounding land uses, as well as promote a citywide <coughs> quality aesthetic environment. Um, this does not constitute an authorization or assurance that the use will be permitted and each application should be evaluated to its probable effect on the adjacent properties and community welfare uh, and may be approved or denied as findings indicate appropriate. Um, this, also, this request would also um, imply that all the other applicable codes, regulations, and standards would still be met. Um, as far as a little bit of background, as far as I know, uh, since I've been here, a request like this has never occurred. Um, in general, there's not any specific criteria in which to judge uh, this request, um, but it does require council's approval. Really, the only guidance that we have in the code states that an electronic message center and electronic message board over 32 square feet is subject to approval by city council. In your packet, I've referenced section 20-920 as far as uh, prohibited signs are concerned. And within that element, it does describe electronic message centers um, in the B1, B2, BP, and I zoning districts. Um, anything between eight square feet and 32 square feet are a use by right. Anything larger than 32 requires approval by council. Um, in, your, in your packet, in your application, the applicant is requesting an electronic message center that is approximately 142 square feet. This is um, about four times greater than what's allowed by right. Um, the applicant has provided examples of signage at other TransWest facilities that have these similar message boards, including the size, as well as potential com competition. Um, I do want to note that um, in your review and analysis, uh, as we've had in other discussions on signs, that um, your evaluation be, should be based on content neutrality. So it's irrelevant of the type of business that's using the sign as well as what they're putting on the sign. Um, we've got to keep it neutral. Um, again, there's not any specific criteria which to evaluate this request. However, um, staff has recommended the following to be taken into consideration. Um, examples provided uh, in staff's opinion do not represent the typical electronic message center size in Northeast Colorado. Um, through general research by staff and myself have found that business along the <coughs> I-76 corridor uh, from approximately Commerce City up to Sterling, as well as US 34 from Greeley to Fort Morgan currently don't have message boards of this magnitude. There are a couple exceptions. One would be Weld County Garage in Greeley. Um, and that's actually a little bit lower to the ground. And the other one would actually be uh, Transwellis that's near Commerce City. Um, in general, as we found in this area, signs of this nature typically are more prominent in metro areas as well as along interstate corridors. And we're in an interstate corridor ourselves with I-76. And again, um, current businesses don't have signs of this magnitude either. Um, the other thing uh, that we used in our analysis is there are approximately 10 other electronic message centers within the city limits. Um, from our measuring and analysis, none of them exceed the 32 square feet. Thus, that's why you've never seen an application like this before. Uh, some of those, uh, just to refresh everyone, is Morgan Community College, the Hospital, Bank of Colorado, Walgreens, Dairy Queen, Edwards Market, uh, FMS Bank, the Credit Union, McDonald's, and Arby's. Um, all those signs are under 32 square feet. Some are as small as 18, some are around 28, and some are long and short, and some are square. Um, the other item, too, is related to the new draft sign code um, that's been going through several months of review by staff, planning commission, and yourselves as council. 
um, and we expect to have it adopted uh, within December of this year. Um, to refresh everyone's mind, staff was directed through the comp plan process to develop a new sign code to minimize nonconformance to the existing signage. As we had discussed in the past, when the sign code changed in 2010, inadvertently we found that a lot of existing signs um, became nonconforming, to, not to their fault. Um, and so as part of our efforts to then meet all the all the regulations now required at a federal level as well um, for signs to try and make as many signs that are already existing in the city as compliant as possible. Um, some items as it relates to this case that apply into the draft sign code is that uh, not more than 40% of the total sign area may be comprised of a message center element. Um, this is fairly consistent in other communities. Uh, such as a, a neighboring one to us, as well as other uh, further to the west. Um, this would mean, uh, in this case, even though the total sign isn't fully vetted in here, that the sign that's proposed of 209 square feet and 145, that message center would be close to 75, 80%. And if this was a new sign at the first of the year that was proposed, it couldn't exceed 40% of that total sign proposed. Um, also, uh, setbacks is a big one that we're trying to rectify and correct in the new sign code. Um, with all the varying setbacks and all the different issues and those kind of things, um, the new sign code does allow business districts to have a setback, a minimum setback of two feet, which is more in compliance of what we typically see in other variances and other issues you've seen on signs. Um, that's consistent along that 34 corridor specifically, as well as along 52. Additionally, the maximum sign area um, for freestanding signs, uh, staff and planning commission have recommended one square foot of signage for every two linear feet of street frontage, um, but not to exceed more than 150 square feet. Um, something to note that that requirement was actually <laughs> requirement of the sign code prior to the adoption of the 2010 code. So um, that was actually in the business district zoning that that was the criteria that had to be met, which generally means that most of the signs, at least in the 34 corridor and other areas, are usually around that 150, 200 range. In your packet is uh, Exhibit A, which was provided by the applicant. Um, I could put those up on the board if you would like. Um, as well as Exhibit B, um, where staff has prepared a comparison of what's allowed, what's proposed, and what's recommended. So I will put that on the board. Um, so briefly, the big gray area. Um, best I could do, okay, Tim, I just made it a big gray area. Um, this area here is, is the proposed area that we're discussing uh, that's 145 square feet. Um, again, the other elements of the sign at this point um, don't really apply, which is why we reference this is to discuss exceeding 32 square feet for the electronic message center aspect. Again, they've provided examples of where they would propose, as Jason mentioned, um, the proposed location ties into the next agenda item uh, versus um, by code. This is in the B2 district, which has a setback of 25 feet, which would, if they met all the requirements of the code, it would move it 25 foot back. Um, they provided some information, again, as some of the window signage and square footage. Um, uh, the applicant's representative did a very good job in his presentation and in his packet kind of showing the other signs that existed um, that exist now and what their intent would be should this be approved. Um, he's also provided examples as we've discussed um, that they have that is what the style is that TransWest as well as um, potentially other competitors and other like businesses are moving to. Um, Again, as you notice, uh, the majority of their style, these signs do exceed that 40% that limitation, not just for this request, but as 
is standard in, in their business model. Um, this is a good example is what we were discussing, <laughs> even though they've mentioned a typical uh, competitor, we have a competitor here, but they don't have that sign, nor would they be allowed to without coming and getting a similar request. Um, but they're also on the I-76 corridor, so there is a little bit of difference of going in staff's position from going 80 miles an hour versus 30, 35 miles an hour if you count. This example, that's a, an example of typical what you may see in a, in a boulevard such as 34. However, what you'll notice in this example, um, here and here and here, the prominence of billboards throughout that corridor. Um, so again, we don't discount that in order to compete with that type of allowance of signage, they do need to do that for that business model. This is again, not them, but their competitor, but obviously trying to com compete as a local as well as all the off-premise signs that seem to be about every 300, 500 feet apart. And we don't have that in Fort Morgan. We have one remaining billboard. One was removed um, as part of the O'Reilly's development um, that was over by Edwards. That one was taken down and current codes wouldn't allow it to go back up. The only other remaining one is um, right down the street from the applicant's location. <coughs> For those of us that are mm -hmm. spatially challenged, um, can you, using maybe walls in here, can you give us a, I'm a visual person and sure. I'm having trouble vision large the sign mm -hmm. was, would be. Um, the blackboard right there is typically an eight by four or six by four. Um, so that's kind of in the realm of what you'd see as allowable by code from a message center. Um, these are 12 foot high ceilings, so which would be similar to their request. They have eight foot and then four foot for trans west. And probably from the door over to the ex exit sign would be about 18 or 20 feet. So in their request of 142 square feet, that's eight foot high by about 17 foot long, it would fit within the, the area of that wall. And then trans west would be the upper four feet of that element. Again, as a perspective, um, when we talk about being closer to the interstate, when we look at um, the Hampton Inn, the Maverick gas station, um, McDonald's, those signs, not counting the secondary ones that are below it that have the words that could be electronic message centers, uh, those usually run in about the 150, 200 square foot size, um, which again is very similar to in their, their request, but not from an electronic message center. And that's what this request is related to is the size of the electronic message center. Any other <laughs> questions? And, and I'm, I don't know if pixelization, is pixelization the correct term for brightness? Or, and there we have that in the sign code, correct, for? Yeah, and that's a general standard. So most of them, um, they're brighter during the day and then they downscale them. The one that they're proposing in the dark, that it becomes dimmer. I know we have a couple cases in town that we have to remind them to make sure the dimmer settings, um, we know where those are <laughs> um, because they're using the same daylight brightness. But these systems that they have, um, again, they go into detail in his application about the styles and the elements and you know um, the, the upcoming style, I think is, as far as staff's concerned, we don't discount all those items, but we also want to look at how our model is going to be in the coming months as far as being as consistent as we possibly can um, and reduce non-compliant items or something that's unique to other areas that we currently see in town. Just don't want to blind anybody as they're coming in on 34 <laughs> or be able to see it from space. No, they would, con they, they would control that. And again, we would regulate that. And even if they didn't, when the new sign codes adopted, we have that in our standard. Um, as far as how to measure those and make sure and that's we a dialing have. back kind of a thing. It's literally a, a, a dial. They, they set it up and that's exactly how it works. And so it's kind of, and that's typically how staff will evaluate from sunset to sunrise <clears throat> brightness. This also controls, um, in this case, because it's facing east and west, 
It doesn't necessarily have the same effects to neighbors and oh, properties. Um, what's in our code, um, they, they far exceed that, but generally electronic message centers aren't allowed within 100 feet of a residential. And the residential area is to the south, and then there's a couple homes that are on this corridor, as, as you're aware. Um, B1 is predominantly US 34, and um, we want to encourage mixed use which is why you see a combination of homes and businesses, which is what we're trying to encourage, not a strict business corridor that you may see in metro areas where the homes don't coexist. Um, the intent when we did the comp plan, economic development is to start having more of those shared uses, which is what we already have, and we want to preserve that and continue to, to allow it. This property is very unique in the case that it's the only property really along that 34 corridor that's zoned B2 which is strictly business. But they're also a larger lot, which they've talked about in their proposal. Um, it's about 350, it's 350 feet of frontage along Platte. Um, again, that kind of aligns with our one, one for every two square feet that we're proposing in the sign code, not to exceed 150. And so as you see in our recommendations, we're recommending 60 square feet. Um, that would be in line with 40% of the max allowable of 150. So even if they put all of this aside and came back in a couple months, you might not see some of these elements. So in our approval by staff, we're, our attempt is and our recommendation is, is to try and be, bring it in line with consistency that we already have in the community, but also be consistent in what we're trying to accomplish as we're going through and, and working to adopt this sign code that's um, running through its last little iterations. Um, so as, as I was implying in the actions requested, uh, staff does recommend to approve this case um, to allow a message center greater than 32 square feet subject to the applicable sign permit, which would mean they still have to come and get a sign permit, and to be utilized with the following conditions. The message center does not exceed 40% of the total sign area or 60 square feet and the approval must be implemented within three months. I don't think that's gonna be a problem. They're ready to build it. They've got everything <laughs> ready to go. As well as it runs with the land um, until the sign is removed. So in case they find a bigger property because they're being so successful here in the community and move to a bigger location, we wanna make sure that it stays kind of in the per uh, perpetuity. If someone else takes that, as long as the sign's there, that it stays, that it doesn't have to get taken down um, should they decide to relocate in Fort Morgan or do something else. Okay, so I have a question here. Yep. You're, you are um, recommending 40% of the um, sign. Right. And they are requesting 68%, is that correct? They're requesting, um, based off of, and this is where it kind of blends into the other one, the sign size that they have is 209 square feet. Um, if we treat this as its own individual case as it relates to the message center and the next item, let's say the variance fails, under the current code, the current code allows total signage for the whole property, which is why, why they end up showing the, the window sign and all these other elements. You can have a maximum of 300 square feet anywhere on the property when you total them all together. So from the message center standpoint, if they had desired to just meet the setback requirement of 25 feet, we would still be looking at this case and, and having this meeting as it relates to the message center. And so if they wanted to have a sign that was 209 square feet, it's gonna put you, and, and we, they can make it the whole thing, but if we're gonna try and make it in align with the, with the future code that's 40%, that's why we put the 40% criteria. So I guess, um, I, I don't know if your question, so what, how many square feet is this, is this action that we're saying we want to staff The action is to allow for 60 square feet or 40%. So if they, if 
we don't do a reduction in the sign size and we leave it in their next application of 209 square feet. Forty percent of two hundred and nine would be eighty three square feet that would be allowable if we followed the new sign code, which is forty percent of the two hundred nine. It's still not the hundred and forty five. Where does one hundred and forty five come from? Sorry, that's Parent. what they're proposing. That's They've got they're right now. Is. They're proposing oh. <laughs> a sign that's just under seventeen feet by twelve foot high. The top band, and I'm going to go back to it. Sorry, we're just not no, yeah, tra we're not tracking no, with this the math. Is fine. You're fine. You're <laughs> fine. So some of these are 100 percent, right? The total sign is 200. It's all digital. Okay. Trans West model, or anyone else that would come later, they keep the upper band here as a static sign, like that. whatever it is. This proposal. For the size of the total signage is 209 square feet. It's 12 feet by 16 feet 9 inches. Okay, 209. This band is 4 foot, so if we take out 16 foot 9 inches by 4 feet, that leaves 145 square feet that could be message board. In staff's recommendation to make it a line with the future adopted code is it could only be 40% of whatever the total sign is. So if we wanted to say, yeah, they can do 209 square feet, let's break it down into pieces. And they get their 209 square foot sign and we wanted to adopt or follow the new message center requirements in the, in, in the draft code of 40%. That means it'll be under just under 84 square feet allowable for a message, which is still less than their request of 145. So their, so their sign wouldn't be that big. The as far as staff's recommendation. The digital, right? The, the digital, digital portion. The digital portion the digital. would be We're less. Would be but they're requesting that the sign be 145. 145. 145. Right. And staff's recommendation is 84. 60. Well, Our recommendation is based off of the soon to be adopted sign code. Okay. Meaning that so that this sign doesn't become the only sign that's going to be allowable in the foreseeable future because of the sign code that's going to be right. adopted. And no other business along this corridor is going to be able to do something similar based off of what the future sign code is. So we're trying to help adapt their request, not to the full extent, but also not fully deny it either. The 60 square feet is following, if we just followed the, the draft sign code, which as we mentioned, the max proposed of a freestanding sign is 150 square feet. 40% of that is 60. That's why we said 60. Now you can say if they want to keep the 209, and we just want it to be 40%, then that would allow them close to 84 square feet. In both cases, it's less than what they're requesting. So I don't know if I can clarify it a little differently. <laughs> yeah. uh, the 60 square foot recommendation on the sign, total signage being 150 square feet would be if this code, or if the proposed right. sign code was effective today, that's what would be allowed. So that's basically setting this up for what the sign code will be here in the next month and a half. The <clears throat> middle ground, I guess, is the 80, a little under 80 square feet at a sign of 209 square feet is at 40%. It's kind of looking at the code is changing, but they're still allowed a sign today that's greater than 200 or greater than 150 square feet. So the sign code as it sits today, they're allowed 300 square feet total on the property, they could go put out a sign that's 209 square feet. And that's kind of a hybrid approach of what does the sign code say today versus what is it going to be in a month and a half? 80 square feet is the 40% level. The, what they're requesting is a 209 square foot sign 
with 100 and I forget 45. the number, 145 square foot. So there's a kind of the, the variations. So maybe another clarification. The law as it sits today, the requirement as it sits today, would allow them to have a sign as big as they want. The only issue is that because it's a flashy sign, that it has to be approved by council before it is because it's greater than 32 square. So that's the yes. law today. Correct. What our proposal is, uh, and so that's why it's in front of council to determine whether or not it's going to be greater or smaller than 32 square feet under the current law. Our proposal is that if if this is allowed, that uh, it be allowed under what the code will be in January. Is that since we have no there specific okay. criteria to judge this, and that's why we're trying to right. look at what's going to be adopted. Yeah, the intent of, of staff's part is to not create a non-conforming use right before a new sign code. So, but it, but it wouldn't be non-conforming until the new sign code is adopted. Until right. a new sign code right. comes Correct. in. Right. So, so it's not creating a non-conforming use. It's creating a non-conforming use after the new sign, sign code is adopted. And so the, the question today on, on the agenda is, should this be allowed to be more than 32 square feet, yes or no? The subsequent question is, what limit, if any, do you want to place on that amount? Right. So, so potentially, <coughs> if we were to approve what they were requesting, then we get the new sign code, then we may potentially have other people coming for variances to the brand new sign code in order to be competitive with what was, we would be approving today potentially if we gave them what they wanted. Is that right. potentially? So potentially we're the opening the door. In front of planning commission. So we would be potentially opening the door for other businesses to come in and say, well, you got that big sign, so we want a variance so that we can put a sign just as big as theirs. Because it's hard, be, not that we're really familiar with sign variances or anything, <laughs> but. I mean, don't, wouldn't they? Wouldn't other businesses eventually have the opportunity to come in and say this is impeding our ability to be competitive? And that—that's the potential argument. I mean, it's hard to predict the future, and and certainly to go back to to Jeff's point, we want to make sure we're interpreting the code as it stands today, because we can't hold them to a standard that doesn't exist yet. But that's the exact point that staff's trying to harmonize: is that. Um, we're following the current law, which requires council approval for anything over 32 square feet, but recognizing that in about six weeks' time, we're going to have a new, um, presuming council approves it, a new sign code and trying to harmonize all of these issues while still being fair to the current applicant and their needs. Um, if the sign were pro built as proposed and for some terrible circumstance in March of next year, it gets run into by a car and topples over, they wouldn't be able to replace it because it would be a non-conforming use at that point. But that's the future and we're not going to necessarily look at, that's a really big at all of those things. Um, what the issue today is what is the current sign code state and that's what we need to apply. As Brad's mentioned a couple of times, the code is not clear as to exactly what criteria to assess in this. It's not like our typical variance or special use where there's a set criteria to look at, the code is, is a little ambiguous and it just says council needs to approve it. So what we're suggesting in making sure that the approval is done in a way that's fair to everybody concerned is to look at those other um So the main issue is the message board. What sign does council feel comfortable with having a message board? If you want to leave it at the 32 square feet, you have that right as, as the code currently or says. Allow a if you want it larger, you can allow it to be larger. If you want to set a limit at, as to that, you have that ability as well. And the reason why we put criteria on timelines too, um, I know they're ready to submit for sign permit, but we also want to make sure it's clear in your recommendations if it is going to be different than the adopted code and they don't submit their sign permit in time, see, then that's where we run into a different loop. So we want to make sure whatever approvals, that there's at least a limit. So if the new code comes into play before they get their sign permit, that we don't start all over. So that's what we want to make sure we give them enough time if they have to make revisions um, to not worry about the adoption of the new code. So is it appropriate to talk right now about what they would 
Yeah, I was going to ask Jason, I know it's not a public hearing, but would it be out of place for the applicant to come up and kind of exactly. talk okay. about what they're thinking? And certainly we're at a public meeting, so we don't have requirements to do one thing or another, but certainly council has the discretion if you want to listen to additional Absolutely. information. There's nothing that would prohibit you from having people because discuss Because the variance it. is going to be on the setback requirements for this sign. Correct, where the sign is located, not necessarily how it's made or what it looks like. So I Both the applicant and their rep is here if you want them to come up and <laughs> yes. talk and discuss and they can give you some more information on their views too. So please. Well I'd sure. like to come on up Tim. Awesome. Come on come up. Come on down. <laughs> John I assume you'd still want them to sign in? Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> but of Where's course. the sign-in sheet? It's a permanent record. It becomes a part of it. What? It becomes a part of your permanent record. Mayor and council members, good evening. I'm George Eidsness. I'm the owner of GP, GEP Investments, Inc., as well as TransWest Automotive. And uh, we appreciate you taking the time tonight and allowing us to tell our story. But uh, if you look up at that sign right there on the board that you're looking at, uh, it may look to you as it, to be a big sign but when you put it in proportion to the building and the lot, when you take a sign and take it off the ground, you take that board that, that uh, he pointed out there and you raise that up 17 feet in the air, it disappears in size real quickly. I, I don't remember the exact formula, but you know, at some point it's half of what it is on the ground. So we're looking at these signs and we're, we're listening to 32 square feet. And I can tell you that we won't buy a 32 foot square foot sign we probably won't buy an 80 square foot sign because it'll be so small that it it will be useless to us we might we might as well not have one we have these signs in other locations uh, the smallest that we have is 300 square feet in four other locations we have them as large as is 500 square feet and I, I've been before councils in other municipalities and we've talked about these same issues and there, there's a concern about signs there's concern about the digital part of it and we get the sign put up and for years later there's never a conversation about it you know these these, these signs aren't uh, detrimental they're not obtrusive they're you know they're to me anyway i'm a little partial i suppose that when that sign has the digital message on it you know it isn't that much different than if you had the whole sign lit with a static message there's been a lot of dealers come and gone in this town when i drive in here on on uh, West Platte, we see a lot of empty buildings. Yeah. Um, some people say that I'm crazy to be here. Why would you go to Fort Morgan, try to establish a dealership when everybody that's been there has failed in the last 20 years? Uh, we think we can be successful. We think we can bring something to your community. We're employing 19 people today. We, we'd like to see that that would raise to maybe 30 people. You know, if, we, if you can keep these people in your, in your city they're not driving to Greeley, to Sterling, to Denver to buy an automobile. They're also spending a lot of their other money in your city. You know, so if you look at the tax revenue that you lose by those cars leaving your community every day, it's, it's, uh, it's a lot of money. I, I come from a small town in North Dakota that's less than half the size of, of Fort Morgan. There's four viable OEM dealerships in that town today. And you wonder like, you know, you got the population base here. Well, why isn't it happening? Well, one of the reasons it probably won't happen is if we can't do something to create activity here to, to attract people into your business, to give them a message of what we have to offer. I know right now a lot of people say, you know, there's been six dealers come and gone in that location over the past 20 years. We don't know what you do. We don't know why you're here. Not sure how long you're going to be here. <laughs> you know. These signs allow, allow us to advertise the products that we have, the services that we have. And I, and I think to be a viable dealer in today's world, 
you have to have these signs. I've spent well over a couple million dollars on these kind of signs, and we do it because they work. They, they attract people into the business. They, they allow our customers to understand what we have to offer. And to, to spend a couple hundred thousand dollars or, or more on a sign that really is meaningless, then we, we might as well not do it. And uh, I, I feel strongly enough that we want to spend the money here, and we want to spend it on this sign because it, it will work. It's proven in our, in our other locations, and uh, I don't know why it wouldn't work here. Just sitting looking in, in your room today, and we talk about the size of signs. I don't have a tape measure along, but I, I, would, I bet that between the two boards that you're looking at here in this small room, there's, o there's over 80 square feet of signage. Put this in, a, in an area that's three and a half acres, 300 square foot or 300 lineal feet of, of uh, frontage, you put that, that sign up in the air, it looks this big, it disappears, it's, it's nothing. You know, the average billboard that you see up and down the highway is 48 feet wide. 14 by 48. Sir, if you're going to speak, can you please approach the microphone? Yeah. So I can... I can the, the people at home like to hear. Just throw it in the slides. I've heard this question. But I guess, I guess my plea to you is, is that... You know, look at this sign for what it is, where it is. Uh, you know, it's, it's the gateway to your city. You're coming in, and it, it's, it's, it'll be a good-looking sign. We've offered to other communities, and, and we've, uh, we've done this in the past. We've, we've told the communities, if, if you've got messages you'd like us to put on that sign, if you've got special events during, in the city you want us to advertise, bring them out to us. We'll flash them up there. We'll put them on, you know, once every two, three minutes or whatever for period of time that, that you'd like to see them. We've done that in other areas, and we'd be happy to do it here to, to help uh, advertise anything that you'd like to advertise in, in your city. Do you have some questions, that, uh, technical questions you'd like to ask him? Or do you have questions of myself, I guess? Does uh, that include Snowzilla? Pardon me? Would that include Snowzilla? Come <laughs> no, down to no. see Snowzilla. <laughs> um, <laughs> The They're proposing 60 square foot for your sign. Your request is for 145 square foot of message board, correct? That's correct. Is there something in between that is a compromise or a, that are you adamant that it, it needs to be 145 square foot to, to meet the needs or what you spell out as, as part of your business plan? 80, 80 square feet won't work. Or, I mean, 130, 138. <laughs> I mean, when we get that small, it just if we took that sign out there and we could put it up, which we have on uh, I'm on drive-by display. You know, if you have anything any smaller than that driving by there, it's it's not really going to do any good. But yeah, I realize people are driving at 30 miles an hour as opposed to 50 and 60. Oh, I do. Yeah, I drive by there. Uh, like I say, this sign is this sign is uh, two thirds of the sign of, of the smallest sign that we have in other locations. And how high up is the sign? Pardon me. How high is the base? Is the uh, I think it's the bottom seven, of the sign. Seventeen and a half feet to the to the bottom of it. So Spatially challenged the, again. <laughs> this is twelve. This, this is twelve feet. It's a third again higher than that. So compared, uh, I think a lot of us have driven to Denver, and there's a pretty big sign on I-76. Well, no, it's on 85 after you get off 76. The trans west there is. No, it's still on I-76. That's on I-76. That's on I-76. Yeah. Well, That's 85 and I-76 are one of the Converge same. right there. How big is that sign? And compared how high to what you're doing that? here, yeah. It's 500 square feet. That one is 500 so it's, square it's about foot. three times the <coughs> the size of what we're asking for here. So I have a question, but it may be a little more for Brad, I guess. Um, I'm a little concerned about um, uh, approving a sign on 
on the eve of um, passing a new sign code, I'm, I'm a little concerned about undermining the brand new sign code that we're looking to looking to put in. Um, and I, I know, Brad, you've put in a lot of time considering all elements of this. Um, you know, his comments uh, are that uh, anything smaller is kind of insignificant. Um, what is your take on that? How, how would you address that issue? Um, that's their business model. Like I say, um, the way they want to do their advertising and the words, as he mentioned, I don't discount that at all. Again, we've got to look at it from a neutral. It's irrelevant of what he puts in and how he's doing it, unfortunately. Um, but again, we're going off the premise of what we've already seen in Fort Morgan, where they've been established. Um, whether it's Edwards Market or Fort Morgan State Bank or those CPMC, MCC that has a lot of graphics. Now, I do agree they're down lower, but that's, again, that's the balance and that's kind of where we're here. Is this gonna be the one case that's over 32 square feet? If there's a new sign code, it's gonna give more flexibility and there's a potential. This is the up and coming trend and there's more message centers you know, they are gonna vary in size, but again, as we're, we've adopted or proposing to adopting, no sign unless it's on the I-76 corridor, as you mentioned, they've gotta be much bigger. Um, and that's where I-76 has a different standard altogether. It's a different type of corridor and a different type of traffic. Um, but no sign, regardless of how big the property is, and our proposal is gonna be greater than 150 square feet. Um, and so, you know, the billboard, as you mentioned, some communities are massive. The one that's right down the street from where they're proposing, that's 10 feet by 25 feet, about 40 square feet larger than what they're proposing. And it's gonna be a little bit higher than what they're proposing too. So again, from the visuals, that's, that's kind of what we're looking at is another sign similar to that. And I think as you drive up and down that corridor, I think you've gotta look at I don't discount what they're trying to do at all. I think it's a great model, but we've also got to look when the next business and the next business and the next business and the next business request to do the same thing. Is that what we have as a vision for a community for the various <coughs> businesses or potential multifamily homes and those kind of things to have a corridor of, of that type of style? And, we're not going to the extreme on the western slope where all the signs have to be about this big and this little or you go out to the coast in certain areas, you know, they're very little. We're trying to create that balance of still giving people the right to do their advertising but also not to make it a free for all either because that's what tends to be that sign clutter as someone had mentioned is when someone has a big one and someone else is gonna try and one up it and one up it, especially as competition gets more and more in those kind of elements. So there's Did not a hard yes or no. We've given our recommendation based off of what we see um, currently on the 34 corridor, what tends to be the trend um, of all the other message boards, why all those other applicants chose to keep it under 32 square foot. I don't, I don't really know that answer. Um, a lot of them are public facilities, obviously hospitals. MCC, they're doing a different type of advertising, more of events and those kind of things. Is there, Brad, is there a cost difference between a, you know, you know, when you say you're not sure why they chose what they chose, is there a significant cost difference in size? Yes. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah, that's the order of magnitude, I think, across any element. I think um, even on this one, when talking with Tim that's designed it, um, even in, in our code, um, it doesn't allow the thickness to be more than two feet, but again, that's old and kind of outdated. They have no intentions, but that's the size they need to have all the extra coolers and everything else. That's a lot of electronics in there that gotta keep things cool. And I know Brent won't mind it, because that's just more on the electric bill, right? So, you know, and that's- <laughs> Yeah, but it's cheap electric. It's rate. cheap electric. <laughs> so, all right. you know, everyone's got a different model. Like mm, I say, very we, affordable. we got a lot of trends of people that don't even have <clears throat> lit signs in the community, even backlit. Um, we see a lot of that in the community as well. They're more of the static, just applied sign. <clears throat> and, so. and when we did, when we begun our sign code mm -hmm. revisions, did we take into consideration height or I don't know I'm not I guess I don't know quite how to articulate height this. off the ground 
So, because uh, it helps me understand that a sign that's at this level, that's this big, is much easier to read, but every foot you go up higher, the smaller. Yes. The smaller and smaller the sign gets. Sure. Did we take that into consideration as part of, I mean, and, and we haven't adopted the sign code. Is sure. that something we should take into consideration? We for, did. Okay. We did take that into consideration. Again, um, setting aside interstate corridor, um, the signage in the even in the current code is trying to be relative to the size of the building to the scale we don't necessarily having a one-story building that's only eight foot high and someone along the corridor wanting to put up a sign that's 60 foot high um, especially when then everyone in town again that's more intended for our intention is that interstate for passer buyers uh, travelers you know just going through to track them um, that's why those are limited so we have accounted for this this what they're proposing the height is generally in line with what we're doing I think in the adoption it's I think 20 foot or 30 foot is the max or the height of the total building so if we have a multi-story building they could go a little bit higher again it meets into the scale is when we're talking comp plan and planning things which is for me as an engineer a little bit different but that's what we look at but every community is really different some don't allow anything any larger than a postage stamp it seems some let it be and it and they all trying to track businesses in different ways and technologies are always changing some areas do it as when you're close to the right of way keep it low so it's not dominating to pedestrians that are encouraging biking and then as you get further away it gives a natural progression of height. There's a lot of different ways yeah. to cut it. There's not any hard and fast. So, Brad, you could be in favor of this, the screen up that shows the sign and the portion of the Yeah. That's because I. I guess I will. Brad, wait, I can. Oh, go ahead. Just Brad. a quick question, because I, I don't know if this is important or not in the, in the, the process that council is going through. Do you know if, if Tim designed, initially designed this based upon the current code? And I guess Tim's the one to answer that necessarily. I mean, was it designed based upon the current up, standards? Yeah. I'll let him come up. <laughs> I'd like to comment on, on why you don't see a lot more signs here, because they're just too damn expensive. Yeah, I mean, if, if they weren't, if these signs weren't the sign 150 to 500, th we've spent over 500,000 for a sign. Mm -hmm. You'd have a lot more people that would would want them, but they're they're not cheap. So I think that's that's one reason. I think another thing is I think you as a city would should be real happy if you had to come to this variance and you had four more entities that want to come in here and spend millions of dollars and put up a half a million dollar sign. I think that would be a good thing. Mm -hmm. I'll let to him. I guess my thoughts is that this is kind of a unique property too. I mean, we don't have a lot of other three acre parcels in the community that are gonna come back in and look at something of this nature i mean it, it, there's just a perspective from you know uh, there's it, this is a unique property i think it should well, be treated uniquely there. in the picture on the right there is a and I, i'm trying to zoom in on my tablet it's Here. not helping oh. who is this who is this sign here Okay, and how high is that Napa sign? Rick, you're, gonna, you're gonna have to come up, Rick. <laughs> you know, you know better. As than soon that. as you open your mouth, you gotta <laughs> sign the sheet and you gotta come up to the microphone. Because your mom's at home watching this and she wants to hear your voice. <laughs> Make sure you sign in. The sign across the street is Napa sign, and we kind of looked at that. It's of similar size. It, the only difference is it's digital. But it'll be very similar to their height and overall size. So I don't think it'll stand out up true. In, in my opinion, it's smaller square. Square footage, it's smaller. Yeah, it's smaller. But it's about the same height. It's of similar size. And from what we look at. So you got to go to the microphone so the people at home people at home love this stuff. I know it doesn't seem like they do, but they do. And, and Rick, you got to sign in, or this goes on your permanent record. So make sure you sign in. I know where you got to be. 
All right, I, I'm Tim Hayes. I'm the uh, applicant's agent, and I'm from Westminster, Colorado. And I just wanted to say that uh, when we designed the sign, the question was asked, you know, we try to design the sign according to what was appropriate as far as readability. So we kind of back into the equation that way. We do distance and readability studies and that sort of thing. So we didn't, don't just grasp a si uh, size randomly. We came up with one that we thought would work and work well. Uh, when Brad and I first talked, uh, we, could, uh, we were talking about you could actually have a, any single sign currently under the code, maybe up to 300 square feet if you wanted to spend it all that way. And, uh, and so we designed it accordingly. Then later on, the issue came out about the current code saying something about 32 square feet just for the digital part. So if it wasn't for the digital, you could, you could have a sign that's 50% larger than the, one, than the one we're talking about which is roughly 200, you could have it much larger. But that's, that's what we did, and um, the, what I just passed out to you, I hope kind of tells the tale a little bit that when this sign goes into its environment, that's what really changes everything. It's not big and obtrusive and it'd be this giant thing. You put it that high in the air at that size, if you put something the size that um, has been recommended, um, I even agree with George, it, it would be pointless, it would be useless. You're not gonna be able to read it. You can't put something up as a picture and, and be able to have a photo of an automobile or make an offer. It won't be large enough to be seen. So we really tried to make it right-sized, not too small or not too big. I mean, because our first line of thinking was, oh, we'll just come in here and ask for 300 square feet. We toned it down long before we even talked to Brad down to the 200. We, we voluntarily said, that's, that's too big for this street, that environment. So we came up with the 200 and that 142 actually of it being digital is what we need. So that's how we arrived at the sign. And if there's any questions, let me know. Or otherwise, I guess that's it. I've got a question. Sure. Um, since I'm new to um, you know, the field of digital displays, so can you talk to me about kind of the process you go through for safety for drivers as far as like static images or just, yeah. Most of those are uh, controlled, and you guys already have that, those uh, control mechanisms in place for safety. You can't flash or blink, blink. <laughs> you can't blink or flash uh, the sign, and we don't ever use them that way anyway. Okay. And there's not uh, a beam that's being directed directly at the traffic. <laughs> I mean, kind of like the one that was Tim, nice. Tim, we don't we don't let anybody happened. flash in town, just so you know. That's, <laughs> we we don't think that's appropriate. Just, you know. no Good flash. ordinance. <laughs> <laughs> like that. Glad you're so the, the safety mechanisms are, are already there in your current code, but we mm -hmm. abide by them anyway. And for our own sake, uh, like it was discussed earlier, we set the dimming on a daytime versus nighttime. We want it to be the right amount of brightness. When messages are too bright, they become illegible or unreadable and ineffective. And so that actually works against our own case if we make them too bright. So okay. it, it's there, there should be no safety concerns with this at all. It's not unique in any way. Great. Only other thing that I would say back to our, our size issue, like we were talking before, I don't know how many people may have known that about a billboard, but that just is a hard thing for some people like, you know, your missionary is spatially, some spatially challenged, and I get this all the time, <laughs> and it even is for, for me too, so it's mind boggling some of these sizes. Who would have known that a, a typ typical billboard is 14 by 48, which is 675 square feet? I mean, it's bigger than the size of a tractor trailer rig, but you put it on the side of the freeway, nobody really realizes how huge that thing is when you walk up beside it. I think, I think the difference, the, the, the big difference here is, is I, I get the, the 800 square feet for a billboard that's on I-76 because you're driving 75 miles an hour and you've got you know, to grab their attention immediately because then they're by. Theoretically, um, we don't have people coming into town here any faster than 35 miles per hour, um, which should give them ample time. So, so is this? So that's the 10 by 25 um, when we're talking about that's the last remaining billboard within the city limits. Of how many board. square feet in space? 250. Okay. So and that's how high? 209. Um, that's probably pretty close. It might be a little bit higher than what they're requesting. It might be a little bit lower, but. I don't know that's, the exact height. It seems higher than this sign does. Yeah, and it stands out like 
like they're mentioning, it sits out on its own. It's not proportionate, it's an off-premise sign, but it's sitting out on its own. It's not, it's not tying it into a building as they're mentioning. That's why these kind of do what they do when they like a massive, because it is to grab your eyes away from the business. So and This is Platinware, I'm sorry. Um, and it's right across from the school district. Euclid. So that's T.O. Charles, that was what was uh, T.O. Charles? Right down here. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, I know where we are now. Yep. Right by Sherwin Williams. And then what right, we want right. to be cognizant of too, um, when we've talked about size of properties, just looking on this block, we have two yes. others that are very similar that don't have these signs. One is Safeway, the other one is the school district, which is at one point wasn't the school districts, it was served as a retail area, so that's potential. So. There are opportunities of blocks to be bought up and become bigger again when we look at the comp plan. Those, again, entryway as it exists right now, but as you are aware, when we talk about comp plan, we still plan on growing further to the west. Um, additionally, what is B2 zoning um, that was annexed just a year ago is these fields right here. Those are all B2 zoning. And so, again, we don't know how big those lots may be, once they get built, they may be very similar in nature and in, and in size. Um, the school district does use a, a school bus for their signage, correct? Yes, they do. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, and that's, we've got that kind of identified in the future. That's okay. kind of big. So, yeah, exactly. How many square feet exactly. is that? <laughs> yeah, so yep, exactly. That? Brad, yes, where sir. did the, uh, recommendation as far as the limitation on 40% being related to a, of a sign being uh, compromised of the dis display come from? Um, a lot of that was when we first started vetting it and hiring the sign attorneys as far as what they see throughout Colorado as far as the general standard. Their original recommendation was a maximum size of only 75 square feet. We change that to be more compliant by moving it to that 150 square foot realm. Um, the electronic Six message five. center, right, that's why we change that. But again, it goes back to it depends on smaller communities or those that are still in counties and not incorporated, those kind of elements. Every community has a different vision and what they're trying to do, just like some communities have architectural standards for their buildings, which we do not. So there's a big diverse difference as far as things work. Now the 40%, um, our current code, other than the 32 square foot, doesn't have a percentage. So a whole sign, 32 square feet right now, the whole sign could go and get built. We don't have that percentage. We added that because that became a little bit more typical that we see. Um, there are some communities that don't. Sterling, for example, which I believe you've got facility going on up there. I don't know where you're yes. at in the process for that sign, but, um, but they don't have, it's just sign is a sign, is again, however they look at it. But a lot of areas where you're looking at Greeley and other elements, um, Loveland, or a lot of them are in that 40 to 50% range of the okay. message center. So again, we're following, not to be standalone on our own little room, but have some rationale as to why, we, why we're doing so, what we're doing. I, I think you can appreciate the difficulty of Brad's job in this process. Oh, yeah. um, you know, one of the things that we have as a direction from councils be pro business, help businesses develop and grow. Uh, at the same time, we want to be consistent across the board in, in how we manage uh, zoning issues. And, and Brad, I think, as you can see, struggles at, not, not struggles, I don't mean it that way, but Th these aren't easy things to make a determination on, especially where we've got a current law, a law that's going to change. Um, but if you look at the current, uh, you know, applicable law, the sign conforms except for the fact that it exceeds 32 square feet. Trying to limit what we're going to deal with down the road, uh, as uh, Mr. Marler pointed out, if somebody has a bigger sign, somebody's going to want a variance, potentially, if they can afford it. And I think that, that's a point that the applicant has made. You know, not everybody can afford a sign uh, this big. You know, in looking at this, that's, that's kind of what we balance. When, when we have an application come in, we want businesses to do well. Because when they do well, everybody's happy. 
business is happy, people that go there are happy, we're happy because there's more sales tax, we want more people coming to this community buying pickup trucks, uh, we want a very reputable uh, dealer here selling uh, pickup trucks, uh, we would like to buy more pickup trucks locally as opposed to from Greeley, uh, <laughs> unnamed place. And the, uh, you know, that's what we're looking at. We, we want the business to survive. We want the business to do well. But at the same time, we're trying to strike that balance as staff. Uh, how do we make this work? Um, I, I think you have to take into consideration, because there isn't a standard, what does the business want and how does that work? I mean, that's obviously why we didn't put uh, any standard in there. Uh, to say it's this big or not. It's 32 feet unless council decides under the certain circumstance, under the, these circumstances, it should be larger. Um, I think the other side of that, um, you know, Brad's point, and, and Brad and I spent a lot of time talking about how does, how does this work because, you know, exactly what uh, Mr. Marler brought up of, you know, what do we do when we adopt this new code in two or three weeks and somebody else comes in and wants it? Are we going to then be in front of the planning commission over and over and over looking at these uh, standards? And if we're going to make it bigger, why don't we make it bigger in the code before we pass it? And, and so those are, those are policy decisions that, that you want to think about tonight. Uh, because if this makes sense, maybe you want, when we bring the code forward, to do a different standard than what everybody else is doing. Brad's job is extremely hard because he has to go by what's in the code. And, and what made this even more difficult is that on a policy level, what he's being told is this sign doesn't work in two weeks. <laughs> and so as staff, we're trying also, we're trying to understand what direction do we need to go in the future? What's going to be best for the city of Fort Morgan? What's going to be best for the businesses? What's going to be best for the overall thing? So this is a policy decision as much as it is a decision on the code right now because we're trying to understand what direction do we need to go with signs when we adopt the new code? Uh, we could be completely wrong basing it off of what, you know, as far as you're concerned on policy, uh, by basing it on what other people are doing. And Brad has spent an inordinate amount of time and lost a considerable amount of sleep trying to figure some of these policy issues out. And so part of this isn't just making a decision, I think, for TransWest. It's, it's making a decision also from policy. Are you okay with this sign coming in at this size and not allowing that in the future? Uh, or meaning that you would disallow this well, sign maybe with yeah. the new code? Or, or are you looking at, uh, have we had it wrong in the proposed um, policy that we've been bringing forward that we aren't allowing big enough signs. So I, I, this is a hard uh, question because of that. Right. I think any other time probably not very difficult, but we're trying to mesh a current policy with a changing policy and, and what makes sense in that corridor, what makes, what makes sense in the city all, you know, all around. And, and I think there's a lot of factors to look at. But you know, overall, that's what we balance. We want businesses to do well. We're pro-business. We have a business development, uh, economic development office that we created to help promote business. Uh, but we also need to understand the policy moving forward so that we can be consistent with all businesses. That's really the crux of the, of the whole discussion tonight. And, and by no means does us questioning us speak anything towards the work that you've done on this. I think for me, I lean a lot towards, I'm not, I'm not so sure about the sign code now, you know, because yeah. have we missed something, you know, and I'm sure that's not what anybody wants to hear because, you know. Well, like we talked about, especially there's Brad. a lot more details in that sign code, but I think as we disseminated the, I think as we found that right now when we're allowing 300 and yet no one's ever taken advantage of that over the last seven years and this is the first case of a one side 300 square feet that's where we're going off of right. what's what's the city done mm -hmm. historically that was the main premise of adopting this sign code is historically what have we seen and that's what we're trying to maintain to not totally shake up the world that it's nothing different. Same thing with the message center. They've not ever seen anything over 32 square feet. So when we're adopting these things, and maybe this will be the only case that ever occurs because yeah, no one else can afford it or wants to invest that kind of money in it. <laughs> right. But again, we can't judge that. Now, not to complicate things more, 
No, Sorry. We've, we've complicated no, no. I did have my right draft ahead. ordinance because we did it at planning commission yesterday. <laughs> and remember, we keep using the word variance and there's alternative site and program. There's even limitations to that, that it doesn't give them free reign to go to whatever size they want in their That's application. Okay. A detached sign can only be proposed 150% more than what would be in the adopted size. That being said, if the max was 150 and they went through the variance process through planning commission, they could request up to a sign, not message center, a sign up to 225 square feet. That would be permitted two foot off right away. Now, the message center stuff, if we decide to change it, would still be 40%, even if we changed it, <coughs> the size, which puts us right back at that 80 square feet. So there's still a lot of, so, Tim's very creative and he knows if they don't get, he'll go and digest our ordinance a little bit more and find a way to get something <laughs> that meets those elements. And that's what we're trying to try and find a way, I think we all are of, let's not make it too non-conforming, but there's gonna be a lot of other avenues to try and get things. And that's why I think we wanna focus yeah. on the message center aspect. Um, you know, and maybe that ends up being the only element we have to look at further if that's up and coming yeah. trend. But so is there a height limitation on the the message board? I mean, no, it's okay. considered part of the primary sign. So it's, whether it's electronic message or whether it's static, the, the height of the sign would always remain. So you can't be lower if it's a message center or higher. They all fall in line with one another. So. And if I could interject, that 40% that's in the draft code can be changed by council if yep. you think it's not appropriate. Sure. When that draft is brought, you can have it changed to 50, 60, 75, 100. It's, it's up to you and based off of what you want to see in the community. Just when is this code What's that? scheduled to come back to us? Has it been passed by or off? Okay. gone through the yes. planning commission? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's scheduled for the December 6th, first reading. And what were some of the planning commission's comments? Did any of this come up with them? No. Where did no, we talked about different sizes, and that's what we had vetted. 75 square feet was way too small, and we end up still having a multitude of signs that become non-compliant. So staff was directed to go and look what wow. was in the community, and that's why we were finding many of the signs outside of the interstate corridor were ranging in that 150, 200 range, especially on the primary roads. Where were these sign attorneys out of? Denver, not, not Boulder, but they've not Boulder. Proposals, yeah. Just make that clear. When Boulder, that was no, the, not my Boulder. point exactly. No, they but they've been California or uh, Boulder. I, I know some of the stuff actually um, that was used um, that they did was similar to what's been adopted already in the sign codes and um, brush and some other areas. They've already passed it. Again, we we're. A lot of elements when we compared, we're allowing a lot bigger signage so, and even right. brushes in their corridors. But. So, but hasn't the digital message thing really changed? I mean, you know, signs, the ones that you talk about and I think about typically have, you know, the light bulbs and stuff running mm -hmm. across, whereas the signs that I've seen, uh, like they have up here and everything, are more like a big screen that has a Absolutely. picture and everything. You watch the Super Bowl. So yeah. I, you know, I think that that makes a difference too, because, like I said, when you see those, that truly is most of the sign. Whereas digital message, when I think about it, is the thing that scrolls across scroll. the bottom and everything, mm -hmm. or throws up the temperature or time or something like that. So I think that this is a different type of sign too. And that, and that's, and like I say, that's again the balance because we have some well, communities that they don't care whether it's a message board or not. To other ones that limit it to thirty percent, forty percent, fifty. It, it's what you want for your specific community. So even when we were doing that and had our sign attorneys, they started with that initial draft that you all saw when we first brought, and we kind of continued to take the elements is how do we make it more applicable to Fort Morgan? That's what they came out and looked at the surrounding area and what community, what we wanted. That's how so, we were looking at temporary signage because we wanted to make sure we're as compliant as possible. So I, I want to simplify the situation really quick because this is complex. It's a complex policy decision that needs to be made by council when we do the new sign code. 
To simplify it, we have a current code. We need your help when we get the new sign code in front of you in two weeks to understand what it is you want. Tonight, I think, unless George uh, booked a room at the hotel here, I hope you did, and I hope you'll stay here and eat a couple meals while you're here. Uh, that would help out. But um, the, the, the bottom line is the code allows for 200, uh, they could have a 200 square foot sign as long as it wasn't like a TV. But Anything over 35 foot TV, which we'd all like to have in our house, by the way, um, has to be approved by council. There isn't a standard of what that has to be. What we're confused on is the policy direction that we've received from the planning commission and from council has been to make those smaller. If that's not the direction when council wants to go, then we take that up. When that comes in front of council, we make that decision. Meanwhile, uh, unless, George, do you have a room here tonight? Uh, oh, George doesn't have a room. Uh, could you get one? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I, I don't want to belabor the point. I think we've made the, the, the point of the, the problem we have from a policy perspective and what makes sense from staff's perspective and what we have been working on and Brad has been working on very hard for the last several months and what the current code says. And I, and I think... What, what we need to understand or what we, I guess what George wants to know tonight, can I have the sign that I want that Tim designed based upon the current standard so that uh, he can, you know, uh, show Snowzilla or the Super Bowl on, on it. Well, you don't do the Super Bowl. That's copyright. That's I don't moving. think you, yeah, that's moving. You can't do that. But Snowzilla, <laughs> Snowzilla. Wait, no flashing signs. We don't like flashing. Uh, we got that down. So, you know, to simplify it, that's really what we're looking at. Okay. Why it is so complex is because we have kind of a mixed message on what the overall policy for the city moving forward is going to be. And as Jason pointed out, it's not non-conforming now, but if we adopt the code, it could be in two weeks or in a month. And that's what we want to avoid. So we haven't so we can't make done the, the sign code yet. Right. We can, that one portion of that sign code can come back and we can... And review and assess because this is a different, unique portion of it. Yep. And I'll be honest with you, when the sign code came, this was not a, a an aspect that came <laughs> up. I apologize for Where the effort. I know you've spent ago. a lot of time on this. You've taken a lot of hits and grief. And, and that or you get paid for it that's, so that's right um, <laughs> well it's fine we just want to make sure that we're consistent again where the staff becomes enforcers and everything else and we're fine whatever whatever your direction is we just want to make sure that when they move forward we can be clear when they're getting their permits and those other other elements that we understand and then when other people come and ask us so they can come yeah. and ask us and we can give them a definitive answer is to, is to why things were so we the staff support your decision any way you look at it this is one of those that where 32 square feet came up that it had to go to council if you want the 142 we're fine it's a moving technology if it encourages other to invest more money in doing it i don't think having these will turn us into a las vegas main street because that's moving parts and everything else this <laughs> that's the trend Sorry. and we can get higher quality signs and those kind of elements you know i think it's fine we change over but time and technology yep absolutely. we're going to mm -hmm. technology right Charles? but brad's brad's point also is that <laughs> the next thing on the agenda is a variance. variance under the new code that's not an issue right that's exactly right and so again, when we're looking at this application, <laughs> this presumes that they would meet all the requirement, other elements in the code, which would also mean that what they're proposing, if you approve this electronic message board, and this is approved, they have to meet all the other criteria, which would mean a 25 foot setback per today's code but we can't talk about that now right right that'll be next so that's <laughs> that'll be next. right and so but that's why this to becomes be, that to be continued element. <laughs> yeah. so but that would be a variance <clears throat> that we will be discussing in the next agenda item which <laughs> there will be separate evidence for that it'll be it'll exactly. be separate yes. right but yeah, so this would this would imply that they're going to meet all the other elements of the code um we just need your approval and that's why we were trying to 
combine all these different elements and to do different and parts. And we just yanked them all apart, didn't we? Well, it's, it's okay. <laughs> we're just we trying to do what okay. council wants us to do. I think yeah. Brad's point is we're just trying to do what yeah. council wants us to do. Understood. So well, I guess you get to make the decision tonight as uh, is your prerogative and responsibility. Other questions? We have a man that looks like Santa in the uh, back row that was raising his hands. I think he'd like oh, to speak. Harry? You got to sign in on the permanent record, though. I mean, <laughs> and, and while he's coming up. You know, while he's Tell him, oh, oh, go ahead. I'm going to say while he's coming up, one thing that I would propose, I think, sounds kind of as an, uh, could be a compromise, is approving the way that it says suggested here, but rather than where it says under action requested, rather than 40 percent, change that to 60 percent. 60 percent is 125. 68 percent is what they were requesting. Would you settle for 65 percent, which is 135 square feet? Nice they want 145, correct? <laughs> 142 is 142. So we could put something no more than 140 in the code when it comes back. That would be acceptable, would meet. So, Mr. McAllister, okay. grand to see you. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Council and Mayor. Um, you knew that I, it had to do with automotive. You knew I would be here. <laughs> uh, Outcome it, Santa. Yeah. <laughs> You know, in, in regards to the, when we were talking about the size of the property, three and a half acres or four acres, whatever it is, and the size, uh, being a previous Ford dealer, uh, Ford Motor Company would come out and tell you what size sign you need for your property. I had, I had uh, four acres right at the edge of Fort Morgan here. Mm -hmm. And they come out and they put up a sign probably bigger than that that he's talking about, maybe a little bit bigger than that because we had Ford, Lincoln, Mercury franchise. So you had the Ford sign and then the Lincoln and the Mercury. And uh, true, it wasn't a message sign as such, like we're talking here, a digital messaging sign. However, the, Ford thought their message was their product and for their dealer and to, uh, to make it work for him. So they made us put up a sign that was basically a white sign with blue letters on it, and that thing was bright. You could see that on the DLD two miles west of town. On a good day, you could see it when you got on Highway 34 coming off of I-76. So I understand when you get up in the air, which we had to have that sign way up in the air. Some of you probably still remember it, but mm -hmm. it was a long ways up in the air. Then when you got to the other end of the lot, we had another sign the used car sign, which was not quite that big, but probably mm, three-fourths that size, three-quarters of that sign on the other end. And uh, I had that store for 17 years and never had anybody complain about the brightness of that sign. And actually, they liked it because it would made a nice yard light, and for safety reasons, they actually <laughs> liked it. They didn't, of course, at the edge of town, that's the corridor to town, it was on the edge of town, you didn't have all the street lights that uh, we have in the city, so it was kind of an, uh, an added thing to it. But that's that's just one of my things I want to bring up. Um, the other thing too, I I hear you talking about uh, the, the messaging part of it, and, and uh, the owner brought up the fact that, George brought up the fact that he would be willing to put messages on this sign. If, if I remember right, when I was mayor, we were talking about some way to put up some marquee <laughs> signs on our corridor on Main Street so that we could get messages to the public of things going on at the schools, maybe a, a, a championship game or something coming on. I mean, is this a, not a better way to put to do both? I mean, you can put up a sign that this gentleman would like to have for his business, plus a marquee sign that we wanted, and somehow during all this, why the the tourist board decided, I don't know what, uh, Lisa knows all about the tourist board, but somehow this went away from us, and we don't have a marquee sign. But this would definitely be a, a nice way to do that. I guess thirdly and lastly, I would hope and I just and I, I, I really trust in you guys that the council that you would make this decision uh, on this part. Of what I'm just going to say, not not his sign on. I, I can influence you only so much, but 
I would hope if they're planning on putting a stop sign at the end of my street next week, that if I go down to the corner and turn and don't stop, I hope I don't get a ticket. Just because they're planning on putting a sign up. Yep. Next uh -huh. week. Yep. So <laughs> that's Thank you. Only if you come up to the podium and sign in. <laughs> All right, so while he's coming up, I just want to reiterate it's kind of the legal standard, making sure that whatever decision council makes, that it's not based off of the particular use of the sign. Very clear that it's to the size of the property, the surrounding area, not necessarily because of any particular type of business versus other types of business. Correct. Point taken. Thank you for the <laughs> reminder. I know that was said at the very hey, beginning, but it's good to... We should start this, former mayor's night, just, you know, have them all out. <laughs> this is good. <laughs> You should be getting... No, 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 no. <laughs> My name is Glenn Steinke. I live at 805 Park. And uh, today I, I took advantage of the opportunity to walk in this building and I put a Transwest brochure in each of your desk files there. So hopefully you would get some idea of the scope of this company, this billion-dollar company that this man has put together. And he's chosen Fort Morgan as a spot for one of his outlets. And I see people, pardon their progress. I think this is probably part of progress for Fort Morgan. Keep in mind that normally when a company this size chooses to go into a, a location, they'll get in touch with that location before moving and they'll ask for concessions, whether it be taxes or utilities or curb cuts or whatever. This man didn't do that. He simply paid the bill moved in here and he's building what I think is part of a great, great company. And hopefully it will be progress and hopefully it will grow from here. And I hope that you will, you folks will give him a positive consideration for what he's asking for. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Lynn. Thank Thanks, you. Lynn. No more mayors? No, no more mayors. <laughs> for the current mayor. <laughs> well, what go. would you like to say? <laughs> <laughs> you, you have the microphone. Well, Let's move. And I think we've covered a lot, unless anybody else has anything on council they want to say that um, we can allow or disallow, but we're at a point we can make a resolution to take action on, on the sign, whether to allow Trans West to put it up or not? Your Honor, I would offer a resolution to approve case 16-021 EMC Trans West EMC to allow an electronic message center greater than 32 square feet subject to the applicable sign permit to be utilized by the following conditions. The electronic message center does not exceed more than 68% of the total sign area or 142 square feet, whichever is more restrictive. This approval must be implemented within three months from the date such approval is granted and that the use runs with the land only until such time the sign is removed. Second. So just to clarify, this is what TransWest is asking for? Yes. Correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, I have a resolution by Christine Casto and a second by Lisa Northrup. Vote by roll call. That resolution carries unanimously. Thank you. Snow okay. <laughs> I wonder if there were any other dead horses you want us to beat for you? Yeah, we're getting ready to do one. <laughs> yeah, we're getting that the next agenda item. <laughs> <laughs> next on the agenda, we have a public hearing for an application for TransWest for a variance to allow a freestanding pole to be installed less than the minimum current setback. The council will be acting in its capacity as a zoning board of appeals for this hearing. This is a public hearing. Please keep public comment to the issues before the council. Each speaker is asked to limit their comment to three minutes unless the speaker represents a group of citizens in which event additional time may be allotted. 
please respect these limitations. I reserve the right to limit public comment that is inappropriate under these guidelines and otherwise improper. I also reserve the right to limit testimony and questioning that is repetitive, cumulative, argumentative, or not pertinent to these issues. And to set a limit on the duration of testimony if I determine it necessary in the light of the number of people who have signed up to testify. First, the issue of legal notice. Mr. Brennan, was this properly noticed? Yes, Your Honor, a legal notice of this public hearing appeared in the Fort Morgan Times on October 26th. Next is presentation of the application. Mr. Curtis. And Your Honor, if I could interject briefly, given how intertwined the last I item was to the current issue, okay. uh, making sure that we have preserved on the record an appropriate reflection of all of the evidence that City Council is considering, I would recommend that you take all of the previous discussion and just add it more or less as a footnote because um, I anticipate that that might affect your decision making process and it's appropriate to have that evidence as a part of the record. So everything from item 12 will be part of this public hearing? Correct. That's the suggestion that I would make. So, now, right? so <laughs> essentially they take judicial notice of what the previous item was and that would then become a part of the official record of this hearing? Correct. Okay. Thank you. So I guess it's, that would have to, so long as the applicant's okay with that. Yes. <laughs> you don't want to say it again? <laughs> He's like, I don't know. <laughs> Perfect. That's Mr. a great Curtis. idea, Jason. <laughs> My turn? Yes. Thanks. Um, I won't go over the background. Um, but a small part, and some of it was lended to, that some of the previous comments as far as standards and dealerships were concerned. Um, in general, in that, the background, again, this is still referring to Chapter 20, Article 9 of the current code. Um, and also prior to 2009, uh, dealerships were generally operated under the General Motors family, um, which also had their own standard for signage. Um, in the style and size and type based off of the property. Uh, upon the closing of Fort Morgan Auto, which was um, the last General Motors family, the sign was removed. However, prior to 2009, there was not immediate, any immediate evidence that the previous sign had posed any significant issues. Um, in your packet shows visual evidence of the prior sign um, and it is attached. So this was the General Motors prototype. Um, that sign no longer exists. It was taken down when uh, Fort Morgan Auto uh, had closed up. Uh, potential issues based on the submission in regards to a pole sign and B2 zoning. Uh, the following regulations apply. Uh, Section 20-950 subpart A, no sign should be erected within the road right away near intersection. Um, and in a manner to uh, obstruct free and clear vision of motorists or pedestrians at any location where by reason, po position, shape, color may interfere with, obstruct view of, or be confused with any authorized traffic sign, signal, or device. Signs located at an intersection must be outside the vision clearance triangle. Um, as this relates, uh, the sign in its proposed location is designed at a height and distance that would not adversely impact public safety and is not within the vision triangle. Uh, the next part in this case uh, relates to section 20-9-60, table 9-3 for freestanding signs. Per the current code, as is adopted, the minimum setback is equal to the building setback. Um, per zoning requirements, this would mean the minimum building setback, which is defined minimum front yard setback is 25 feet. Um, so per following code as the current adopted uh, code stands, this sign must be installed 25 feet behind the property line. Uh, the issue here is the proposed sign would be installed at a location immediately along the public right of way. The proposed location, however, is consistent with other signage uh, along the US 34 Platte Avenue corridor. 
uh, subsec uh, section 20-960, table three, again, uh, for a freestanding sign, the maximum area allowed is 300 square feet. The additional total sign area on the property cannot exceed 300 square feet. The proposed sign is approximately 209 square feet total. This would be a use by right if the building setback was also observed. Um, what was included in the past application in this one, uh, the reason for the 209 square feet, they would have to do some modifications to the window sign as well as uh, some of the entry signs to make sure all the signage on the property as a whole does not exceed 300 square feet. So that's what we had discussed prior and Tim had mentioned that's why they're not at the full 300, but the 209 would imply the modifications that they referenced earlier that they would have to take care of to make sure that the total site does not exceed 300 square feet. Um, so again, we're still back to just dealing with the setback. Um, as far as the analysis process and criteria for a variance, which is set forth in the land use code, and I've copied it in part, um, the review criteria, the applicant or proponent of any variance carries the burden of proving that the granting of the variance or appeal is justified by reasons which are substantial, serious, and compelling. It must be prepared to satisfy the, to the board to the extent ap applicable the following criteria is met. And as we've mentioned in the past, um, there are seven criteria. However, some of them may not be applicable in this case. Uh, number one, owing to exceptional circumstances, literal enforcement of the provisions of this chapter would result in an unnecessary hardship. Number two, specific conditions in detail which are unique to the applicant's land and do not exist on other land in the same zone. Uh, number three, the manner in which strict application of the provisions of the regulation would deprive the applicant of a reasonable use of the land in a manner equivalent to uses permitted other landowners in the same zone. Uh, number four, the unique conditions and circumstances are not the result of actions of the applicant taken subsequent to the adoption of the regulation from which relief is requested. Number five, granting of the variance will not be detrimental to the public health, safety, or welfare, will not alter the essential character of the neighborhood. Number six, the applicant cannot derive a reasonable use of the property without a variance. Number seven, the variance will not be injurious to adjacent properties or improvements. Additionally, um, to keep in mind in granting a variance, the board may attach conditions necessary to protect affected property owners and to preserve the intent of this chapter. In considering any variance, the applicant and zoning board of appeals must bear in mind unless great caution is used and variances are granted only in proper cases, the whole fabric of citywide zoning will be worn through in spots and raveled at the edges until its purpose in protecting the property values and securing orderly development of the community is completely thwarted. For this reason, variances should be granted only sparingly with great caution since they tend to impair sound zoning that comes directly out of the code. I didn't make that language up. <laughs> Sounds good though, right? Yes. Um, in your packet, there is evidence, applicant support application, uh, support information received from the applicant and their proposal of uh, their, their belief of why uh, meeting the 25 foot setback um, would, would not work for their site. Exhibit B shows the pre-existing sign information, documentation, and size relationship information. As you can see here, this was taken um, when Fort Morgan Auto was still in operation. This is the location that they're proposing to put this new sign at this location. Um, in general, the desires were to be able to obtain that back. Um, through staff's research and looking at prototypical General Motors signage, um, they have a lot of different criteria. Again, it was mentioned earlier um, by the public that they all had their own standards. Um, I'm not an expert in vehicles, but I believe that's a Jeep Liber Liberty, which is generally 14 feet long. As you can see, the sign is smaller. Um, staff's perspective is it's not this 15 by 15 sign that's there. It would fall within the realms of the one that's approximately eight by eight or 11 by 11. Um, we've also in your packet provided the affidavit of publication, postcard notification sent by regular mail to adjacent property owners and a 300 foot radius map. Uh, at the time of the memorandum that was prepared, we'd only received one public response 
and it was received by phone on uh, November 8th from Carla Spiker at 426 Park Street. In general, she had some concerns about the sign and if it was going to be as big as the one that they have near Denver, uh, she was not for nor against. Um, as we talked to her a little bit later after that, she did have concerns about the lighting. Um, however, we've worked with um, the managers there. There's some lights that don't relate to the sign that are spilling off onto her property, but they've already got electricians and are moving forward with that. So there isn't any other violations that we're aware of on the property as that's currently being addressed. Um, action requested, staff recommends council approval of this case uh, based off of chapter 20, article nine to allow a pole sign to be placed as proposed in the application two feet off the back of sidewalk property line and subject to the applicable sign permit requirements with the following conditions, uh, that the sign not exceed 110 square feet as was consistent with the prior sign and its location prior to removal under previous ownership and is consistent with other signage in the area and along Platte Avenue US 34 corridor. In addition, per section 20-3150A3, unless otherwise stated, the board minutes all variances must be implemented within six months from the date the variance is granted. Um, in summary, we went through all the other conversations. Um, in their application, they have lots of other things that will be available for their comment as per the procedures. Staff's position as far as believing you should approve this. Um, as we talk about variances operate a little bit differently. The sign that had existed prior follows these models. And so um, to be able to put that back in doesn't in our mind create any other unusual circumstances or any additional request above and beyond that setback request as it's consistent of what was there prior. Um, and then we've already gone through the different sizes and elements and all those kind of things. So I won't, uh, sure, we don't want to come with that again. No, I won't go into that um, <laughs> any further. So I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. So we and need to. You have the, the exhibits. These these still apply um, as far as the size that they proposed, as well as um, their decisions on location. Um, that the 25 feet, what the, the, the building would be in the way. They're trying to utilize the electrical work that's already in that location. Um, however, keep in mind, it's an auto inventory lot. There isn't defined driveways um, once you get on the property and those kind of elements, so. Is the setback to mm -hmm. the edge of the sign or yes. the center? So, okay, so if we put it this much back, the signs are not going to be hanging out over Correct. The, That's the right. The two start. feet would be as the, far as the size of the sign. So the edge of the sign and from that point to the right the, of it is okay. where that two foot is from. Yes, okay. that's correct. And, and if we were to proceed with this, we would need to change the action to ch uh, item one to be not to exceed, obviously, 110 square feet is needs to be not changed accurate. To that would have to be the 209. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Or do as proposed, but the existing, again, this is, Jason can add to, this is kind of a different element that what they're requesting in sign size in addition to the setback is, is not what was there and consistent with what was there in the past. So the so, size, even though again, as allowable of the 300 square feet, we're looking at the setback and so Again, they're requesting a sign bigger, which isn't really part of the variance, but that's kind of why we were trying to approve that. But the 209 is bigger than what was there prior. So Even briefly, the setback was the same. Briefly, the the, re, the way we took typically look at a variance is if you had it before, we'll try to work with you to have what you had before. What they're requesting isn't what they had before, but that's the operation that Brad's going through, as elaborated previously by Jeff as to how we interpret the code as what it is. And so councils certainly doesn't have to include a limit if you don't want to. If you want to um, make it cognizant of the previous action item and not limit it to 110 square feet or whatever that amount was, you don't have to. It's up to council to decide what you want to do. 
And you've already covered that in both cases. So if you decide to make the sign smaller, that 68% would take precedence over the 142. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions for me? This would similar, and that's the setback is what we also did for Taco John's on the sign. Um, the other the other signs that we've seen on the 34 corridor were related to signs being taken down and have to pull a new permit and put back up. So we're following that premise and standard that we've established over past sign variances <laughs> that they weren't any bigger, but they were taking them down and trying to put them back up at the same location. And they fell within the general parameters of the sign that, that was there before. So those that we've looked at, um, again, those other elements other than this one, as we mentioned, this is a B2 zoning that has a hard and fast 25 foot setback. All the other elements that were included also in that is it related to building setback, but as far as B1's concern, the code said it equaled the actual building. So if the building was 20 foot away, the sign had to be 20 foot. If the, if the building was on the property line, it had, that's where that code was a little misleading. This one, we have a hard and fast defined 25 foot setback. So it's a little bit different from what we saw, but most all the other applications we received, they wanted to take them down and just be able to put them back up. Brad, I have kind of a, maybe this is a question for Jason and I don't know why this came to mind with it though, talking about the different codes and what we're dealing with on a policy level. Um, council's already approved a larger sign. Um, if the setback isn't approved tonight to the two feet, and then two weeks from now, they approve the new code, can they move the sign? Not as the sign, well, the sign code well, draft and that's, would need to be changed a yeah, little bit to no. incorporate the new yeah. uh, message board and sign, et cetera. But that is a, yeah, but a that, creative option we could it, do. It is, and here's hypothetically <laughs> how this would work. This has been fun, by in, the way. In the previous, <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the previous, and you're getting it now, in the previous <laughs> recommendation, oh my God. we allowed that to stand, stand for three months. So that would take precedence in the element as it relates to the message center, even after, let's just say we don't change the draft sign code, that size that we've already approved, the 142 or 68%, is already there as long as they complete it and get a sign permit uh, application in um, by end of February. However, this is a separate case. This doesn't really apply to the message center. It applies to the sign. So as city manager is referencing, if they decided to, if this was to be denied or some alteration that they don't care for, they could either tomorrow go out and build the 209 square foot sign as a use by right and approve to the message center with a 25 foot setback anywhere on the property. It doesn't have to be right where they have the electrical power. That's just their desire. Um, I think the amount of money that they're investing in the sign, relocating a little bit of electricity is, I think, small potatoes. Um, but if they waited and the sign code was adopted that allowed for the two-foot setback, <laughs> well, they still have the precedence already set with the three-month criteria, but then the two-foot setback would be a use by right and then they would just issue the sign permit at that time. So this is a win-win for them. Mm -hmm. It's just done. <laughs> so it's just So it's along. gonna be a timing of when it gets submitted. But again, as Jason's met, mentioned, we've gotta be careful because this is a variant. So we have to look at all that other criteria um, as far as hardships and all those other fine things that we've discussed in the past in evaluating your criteria. So a little bit different standard than we looked at before. Right, Jason? Correct, but to, to wrap it up, we're on the eve of this not mattering, this particular yeah. issue. <laughs> so exciting times. <laughs> yeah, can we be already there? <laughs> so if it meets the criteria of the variance, they'll put it. 
if it doesn't meet within the criteria as required by variance process, then they'll just wait till the sign code's adopted and then they'll come in and get a permit. But then we're not intertwisting variance issues. Okay. okay. Does anybody have any questions? No. I'm still clear. Clint? Yeah, we're good. <laughs> we're good. Just, <laughs> Anything to add? Close to nine o'clock. And you thought you thought finance was fun. <laughs> Variances are even more fun. Yeah. Signs, I won't say it. Yeah. <laughs> Just do it with people, not attorneys, next time. Um, next. Oh, I think you hurt Jason's feelings. No, I didn't mean. I have sign <laughs> attorneys. Oh. No, I get, clarify that. I get it a lot. I, 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 no. I'm fine with it. I was not referring to that. Jason and I have thick skin. It's okay. I was yeah, referring right. to the sign attorneys for the sign <laughs> code. That was funny. Uh. Next, we will hear comments from the applicant. If it's like I have nothing. Any. Does the applicant wish to address council on this? or? Well, if I understand it correctly, we, we can wait to two weeks and go in and apply for what we want. So what, I, I think whatever would work best for the council. Would be, January. Oh, first of January. That cuts into your time. Do you want it early or later? So he takes it back. He wants us to pass this. <laughs> I, I guess we'd like to move forward and get the sign ordered yep. uh, as soon as possible. So if it's not a big issue, we'd, uh, we'd probably request the variance. One, one comment I'd like to make, and, and I think Mr. Lindell brought it up. If you look at this picture, I think you, could you hand that out to him? Uh, mm -hmm. We have. And when you're talking about your, your sign codes, you know, so many times we, we hear about a message sign and you think it's a bunch of words being changed and blinking lights and everything. I would say that 90% of the, of the time on one of these signs, there's a picture there. Just like, just like you'd see in, in, this, uh, in this handout. I think it's just something for you to consider when you're, when you're talking about message signs and, and what you want to do in the future because these message signs that we have today aren't, aren't the same ones that we had 15 years ago. You know, they were blinking lights, flashing lights, changing messages. These are more like photograph. You know, we'll take a photograph and we put it in the computer and put it up on a sign. So they're not, I guess they're, they're not as, as uh, offensive to some people as, as they would have been 15 years ago with the old sign. So it's just a comment I wanted to make that I think you should consider when you're looking at your sign code in, in general. So thank you. Okay. Thank you, George. No public comment, moving right along. <laughs> Next, we'll hear public comments. Is there anyone here that wishes to speak on this issue? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Do I need to sign in again? We know who you are now. Okay. <laughs> Terry McAllister, 923 Lane. Uh, the only thing you're, you're talking about, either approving or not approving, it doesn't matter either way. I really, I really think if you would, if it's okay with the applicant, I'm speaking for myself. He's the one that's the applicant, but I would think you would. I would like to see it approved, the variance, uh, solely because because of the outlooks of the situation. If you dis, if you don't approve, then it looks like it looks like you weren't you for it, and then. 30 days later, it's approved. Because it doesn't matter. Under the, other, under the new. So I, I think for the public and what they're seeing out there, it would, it would look like you're kind of like in mixed. Like now you, you don't approve it tonight, but okay, well, now we have to approve it. So that's something I have to say. <laughs> Thanks, Terry. Thank you. Anyone else? <laughs> Seeing none, 
I'll ask the city clerk, was there any oral or written submitted to your office prior to the hearing? No, Your Honor. Is there any comments by city council? I mean, I know we've been talking about this for a while, but I think this, <laughs> it just raises the standard. I mean, this is gonna be beneficial when you pull into town. I, this, yes, yes, we spent a long time talking about it, probably way longer than it should have been, but this needs to happen. <laughs> and he's got Good a headache. Plan. Anybody <laughs> else? I just quote Larry the cable guy and let's get her done. Okay. I would entertain a motion to close the public hearing. Governor, I offer a motion to close the public hearing. Second. I have a motion by Christine Costello and second by Allison Howell. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Board of Appeals action, Mr. Myers. Council has two options. You can either approve or deny. Look at the um, criteria that have previously been submitted. If you feel that there has been findings or if evidence provided, then you should make findings as to what that evidence is and then make a determination as to what action you'd like to take. So if you feel it meets the criteria, then say that it meets the criteria and that's your findings and then make a motion or if you feel it doesn't do likewise as well does the motion or does the <coughs> resolution need to contain um number one or is it okay that would be 200 yards for feet. you can make it with whatever conditions you feel are appropriate or no conditions at all if you feel that's appropriate based on the evidence that's been provided okay I would entertain action. Your Honor, I would offer a resolution, resolution approving case number 16-021 VA Transwest variance, a variance from Chapter 20, Article 9 of the Fort Morgan Municipal Code to allow a pole sign to pole, man, it's getting late. Sorry. A pole sign to be placed as proposed in the application two feet off the back of the sidewalk property line and subject to the applicable sign permit requirements with the following conditions that the sign not exceed 109 square feet as was consistent with no you want to oh, no, back. no it's not consistent me, 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 me. 209 yeah. feet that did not exceed 209 square feet period in addition per section 20-3-150a3 unless otherwise stated in the board minutes all variances must be implemented within 6 months from the date of such variance was granted second thank you for stopping me <laughs> I have a resolution by Lisa Northrup, a second by Christine Casto. Vote by roll call. That resolution carries unanimously. Go forth and put a sign up. Thank you. <laughs> sure you don't want to spend the night, George? Uh, it's getting late. Most restaurants are closed. You. <laughs> Thank you. Brad. Thank you. All. Thanks, Thank Brad. Thank you. Are we done? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you and good luck. Oh, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Oh, yeah, because if I look through this. Oh, dear. Thank you. <laughs> yep. Thanks for being here. Next, we have an update on our ADA settlement agreement. Mr. Boyer. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor and Council. Appreciate your time tonight. I'll keep this short and sweet. Um, you all know that about uh, three years ago, we entered into our settlement agreement. Um, it's really too bad that they don't, that I don't have any certifications for ADA because uh, my, uh, the grade would be a lot better than what you see in front of you. 60% of all of our issues have been completed. While that looks pretty bad, out of the 120 issues, uh, only 72 complete, um, three years later, I do want to talk a bit about um, why that is and, and, and what we hope to accomplish in the future. So um, you can go facility by facility. We have uh, Old Fort Park, who had, uh, where there are three issues named. They're the only ones that have been uh, completely taken care of, and we have one facility, City Park, with uh, no issues taken care of at, at this point. 
So um, within the settlement agreement, besides the facilities, there's also um, other elements, including training, which we've done very well at, notices, uh, which we've done very well at, and then, uh, of course, the transition plan that we've been working on as of late that um, will be completed by years. And so there's a lot of moving parts within the settlement agreement. The facilities um, are, are one of those parts. Um, if you look at um, the parks, just specifically, um, and how the uh, Department of Justice wrote up parks, I just want to read um, one of their um, recommendations, well, two of the recommendations, and both were in, in parks. So in Fulton Heights Park, um, regarding playgrounds, the play surface is not accessible and there are no accessible routes to the play equipment. That um, is 100% complete. We have um, off-street parking. We uh, um, have an accessible route to the play um, equ equipment and um, the play service itself, which is, would be the uh, engineered wood fiber, is all, is all right. Then you compare that to other write-ups in several of our parks, City Park, Gateway, JC, um, have the same um, issue, but it isn't complete. And their write-up is as follows. Um, None of the play equipment is usable by children with disabilities due to the play surface, lack of, a, of accessible routes to the equipment, the configuration of the elevated play structures, and the height of the level uh, and the height of the ground level equipment. So, in this particular um, issue, you have a situation where the surface is is completely good. Um, it's a engineered wood fiber surface, but um, the play equipment has the issue. So, therefore, they couldn't. Um, give us a, a complete on the entire um, issue. So uh, we need work to do in, in those parks where we have um, the play equipment that's um, still not accessible. Um, fourth thing I want to talk about, um, I could have showed you a 177 uh, uh, page report with a lot of pictures of toilets and, and doors and, and whatnot. Um, we still have um, issues with the uh, toilet rooms, and um, I wanted to s speak about the, the toilet rooms that are at JC Park. You know in the capital improvement uh, budget for next year, which was approved, we're going to uh, wipe away those toilet rooms in JC Park, just have a cement pad there, and our new mobile toilet uh, trailer is just going to be placed out there as needed, and that will be totally accessible, and we'll have finished uh, two of uh, two more items, bringing us to 74 just when we have, um, uh, when we hit January 1, and we've done that work to get rid of those toilet rooms. Um, fifth point I wanted to talk about, and I only have seven. Um, um, a lot of our big projects were completed. So in these 72 items, the big dollar projects have been completed. Um, parking spaces in several of our facilities, that's a lot of cement. Um, a lot of cost. Uh, new entryways, um, again, a big project, a lot of cost, a lot of cement, and we have new accessible routes that we didn't have before. Um, included in this is an entryway that was redesigned for the complex at the south end, uh, also a big project. The uh, entryway for the utility building office, good to go, um, also a big project. So we have a lot of big projects that, that have been completed that were costing us um, the majority of the, the money. We have a lot of small projects um, that won't cost us much that haven't been completed. So for example, accessible mirrors, we have three accessible mirrors that simply just need to be lowered by about one to two inches and will be done. So that's a quick uh, completed issue. Uh, lavatory water supply pipes, we've still got two that are not uh, insulated. So that's um, uh, 20 bucks and, and 10 minutes of time to wrap the pipe. Um, paper towel dispensers, we've got three that aren't uh, accessible, meaning that they're not low enough or they have the wrong type of um, um, mechanism where, that, where someone with just a fist can push down. And then we've got two picnic tables that aren't accessible, and so we haven't extended the picnic table out so that a, you know, a wheelchair can get underneath it. Again, pretty cheap and just pretty easy to do. I'm a, I'm an, and I'm afraid to say we, and I'm ashamed to say we haven't already got those done, but those, are, those will be done here in short order. Um, last point I wanna make, uh, we do have a couple big, um, uh, projects that remain. Uh, parking at the cemetery, although we tried, the uh, concrete that was poured is out of spec and it's uh, um, greater than the allowed running slope. Um, so that was uh, 
uh, although an attempt wasn't uh, good enough to pass muster, so we need to work at that again. The community room uh, kitchenette in the library museum um, is currently being worked on, um, not accessible, but we are, um, we're working on that. A couple counters at the animal shelter in the courtroom, um, they need to be lowered. Um, they were built uh, at a time when you had to have them low enough. We can't uh, get out of that, and um, that's um, some of the bigger projects. There's a fire alarm uh, project at the animal shelter that still needs to take place that's um, on one of those issues that haven't been completed. So all in all, um, we're at a D right now. I think in short order we can be up to a B with 80% completed. And um, um, the uh, Department of Justice isn't uh, breathing down our necks. This uh, report I mentioned, the 177 pages, will go out to them shortly. Um, they see we're making progress. I wish I could come to you and say we're done, but we're not quite there yet. Um, with the budgeted monies that we have next year, the 100,000, um, that will go a long way. We have 60,000 budgeted this year that was intended for um, Legion Field that uh, most likely won't be used for that purpose. Um, we can use those monies in these last six weeks to take care of these smaller items and we'll be, we'll be up to 80% in no time at least. All right, any questions or concerns? You sure you don't want to send us that report? Oh, I'm we happy. We could go through it the whole time. Oh, yeah, night. we could. I could go three hours. You bet, beat the last <laughs> round. Of, of. I do that for Glenn's benefit. Thanks. <laughs> send Thanks. it to Lisa. <laughs> yeah, I'll send it to Lisa. <laughs> A lot of nice pictures. Night night Any questions <laughs> that I can answer for you on our uh, progress thus far? Sounds like we're on the right track. And yeah, we're getting there. It's going to take a little bit to bring us up. Yep. Way better than a D. Just looks like a D. Yeah, that's right. We've done a lot of good. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good job, Michael. Next is presentation, discussion, and possible direction on public art. Mr. Wells and Mr. Miller. I'm going to turn it over to... Uh, Mr. Miller for a minute, but uh, just a <laughs> quick, quick background. Uh, council budgeted $100,000 for art. It was uh, really promoted by one of our past mayors who may be here tonight uh, to come up with some way to uh, put something down in City Park that, that uh, reflects our community and uh, has some sort of reference to the community. So Josh uh, and Chelsea and, and Josh particularly lately has been spending a lot of time trying to figure out how we meet this directive of council to bring art to our community. So I'll let him give you an update on what our plan is. Take it away, Josh. <laughs> Hello again. <laughs> um, council, uh, council, as Jeff had highlighted, previously directed staff to look into some art opportunities downtown. Um, you know, we've done that um, as expected. The cost of installing or having a sculpture Created is not cheap. Um, in this year's capital budget, we have $100,000 uh, budgeted for such uh, an item. And as we've explored these options, what we've encountered is the timeline for the creation of such a statue can be as much as five years. Average seems to be around three for a custom designed sculpture uh, of sorts. Um, but interestingly enough, we were approached by Mr. Weimer, whose wife Dawn is, a, is an artist and has done quite a bit of bronze work throughout the state, has local ties. Uh, they have some interesting pieces that uh, are available, um, but with that exceed our sort of $100,000 mark. So I approached the Heritage Foundation for some financial support and matching funds. Um, they've kind of run into some loopholes, uh, or not loopholes, some issues with their bylaws uh, and are trying to modify those for potential support uh, of such a project. But as the year is winding down, I don't want to lose the $100,000 which is in this budget. So we, uh, and I say we, Jeff and I, are potentially exploring the option of donating those funds to the foundation so that they can go towards this bronze statue implementation, which um, if we can gain foundation support um, as they would modify their bylaws, would total about 12 sculptures to be installed throughout the downtown corridor, the largest of which is Little Bridges, 
Uh, Little Bridges is the most popular in the collection. It's a life-size nine-foot-tall horse uh, with the little girl on it, uh, climbing onto it. Um, and there's some other animals and kids and things that um, would be put on display, mounted permanently, and for the public to enjoy, and walking tours that could be established, and stories that could be told by our curator and educator in the future. And, um, so that's kind of where we're at. Um, I guess the main reason I'm here tonight is is, in, is council in support of um, migrating our funds so that they can be used as opposed to rebudgeted down the road um, and put in a position to where the foundation would be required to obviously do something with those funds as we would describe in an agreement or a contract um, within a certain time period or else return those funds back to the city. That was going to be my question. Yep. What happens to the funds if they don't aren't able to utilize them? Yeah, our, our position bylaws. is is they would have a time period in which to get this project done. If not, those funds would be returned to us, and then we would have to reconvene at that point. So, so the time frame that we're looking at to to get one of these things ordered is about eighteen months uh, from Mr. Weimer, and so the idea would we'd give twenty four months or two years. Uh, we'd put together a contract, and I say we, I mean Jason. Uh, th thanks, Jason. Um, we'd put together a contract, the mayor would sign, and, and council would authorize the donation of that $100,000 subject to the specific art that we want, uh, in, in which we have discussed with them, the 24 months for them to buy it, and if they weren't able to purchase it and get all that done within the 24 months, then they would have to just refund that money back to the city. Fort Worth. And so the idea, oh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say the other thing that is good about this is it uh, allows us to leverage the money because okay. the current working plan would be that the Heritage Foundation would match or at least come close to matching what we put in. So instead of us getting $100,000 worth of art, the city is going to get closer to $200,000 worth of art. So It's, it's a win-win situation. We get a lot more for what we put in instead of going on our own. And we, we put it in there so that if it doesn't work for the foundation, the money comes back to the city. Uh, we can't buy the one big bronze that the, the little too big for britches on our own and it's about 118,000 and to the the package deal that he's doing is really to uh, bring some of that art to our community so the the it's a package deal you can't just buy the one unless you're gonna pay hundred eighteen thousand dollars if you want more than the one then you've got to throw in about another hundred thousand dollars and the, and the foundation has some work ahead of them um, because their bylaws don't allow them to participate in such a project at this point um, there was a vote taken. There was an article on the front page of the Times that the foundation isn't in support of art. Um, they're not they're not in support of art. I mean, that's not the way to, to actually <laughs> phrase that. But there was a vote taken, and, and it wasn't in favor of supporting this project. But not all members were present, and uh, my understanding is, if all members were, the vote might appear differently. So they're starting with a, a revision to their bylaws, which allows them to pursue this project. Um, you know, what they would contribute, I don't know at this point. Um, the hope is that they would match these funds or, or come close to matching these funds. Um, you know, the fortunate piece about the foundation is they have um, a, a large donor base, and this may be a, a fundraiser and fundraising effort for them to, to meet the shortfalls, depending on what their interest is as we pursue this. Unfortunately, their timeline doesn't align with ours, and by the time a modification is made, we don't have $100,000 in the capital budget and we lose the opportunity. So as I have thought about this, my recommendation is we donate the money to the foundation on the terms that we would work out with Mr. Myers, a timeline that's appropriate for the foundation to do the work they need to do, at which point we don't lose the funds, have to worry about rebudgeting the funds and work towards instilling art in our community and downtown. If it doesn't happen, we'd reconvene and take a different approach. Since the former mayor's here, um, and, you know, some of the previous conversation that council has had is instilling uh, a statue on the corner that sort of was a tribute to the founders of our community. 
uh, unfortunately, the original founders of our community, we don't have images of them. It would be quite difficult to, to, to do that. And, um, if we can find legitimate Im images of specific individuals that can be done, uh, it does come at a price and it does take time. Um, the foundation heard uh, a gentleman present uh, to us about two and a half, three months ago, but he produces Glenn Miller sculptures. And I guess the city at one point was presented the opportunity to buy one of those and passed. Um, he's offered to create a new Glenn Miller sculpture, but needs about three years time to produce such an item. And, and uh, at, a, you know, at a reasonable cost, but uh, again, um, we, won't, we don't have money necessarily in a budget for three years from now, so our proposal would allow the foundation to, to buy us some time. And the heritage pictures that you showed before showed that we had horses. Yeah. In our yeah, history. And, and so. the Weimer family's <laughs> local tie. I mean, I don't know all the history there, but I mean, we already have her work on display at the library and museum. The dog out front is Don's work. The mother of the plains, as it's called, in the main entryway at the library is Don's work. Um, they've been a you know, supporter of Morgan County for some time with a lot of her ram's heads and auctions and charity work so there's some local ties there so is this appropriate under our to donate to the the heritage foundation out of this year's and, budget and it's not necessarily it would be for the purchase and i'll let jason kind of speak to the legal part of that go ahead well to answer your question briefly we would be setting money aside for a specific purpose that the public would receive a benefit for right. so whether it's called a donation or a contract, it, it it's, works. It's not really a donation because they can't use it for whatever they want. It's, yeah. it's not a gift. It's a specific, you have right. to do this. And what's with your key, man? Can know. you, like, hang on to that? Yeah. <laughs> found it under a seat. Somebody's probably yeah. looking for it right now. You have to set it um, down now. He's having but a what we'd be looking for tonight is a resolution uh, authorizing the mayor to sign a contract that would allow for $100,000 to be provided to the uh, Heritage <laughs> Foundation for the purpose of purchasing art for the downtown area. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Yeah. <laughs> and I would hope the foundations in support of this have only spoken to Don about this, but he seems to think this is something that works for them as well. So we'd have to take it up with them before. That's my take during the meetings too. Yeah, at the end that of the year. it would go. So so they voted not in favor of this project. What happens if we, we vote to do this and then it goes back to them and they say, no, thank you. They give it back. Money comes back. All right. And by then maybe we added more money to it and we buy it ourselves. Their conversation was about as interesting as your signed uh, conversation. <laughs> tonight, so. You didn't find that riveting? Yeah. Uh, it was one of the longer foundation meetings I've been a part of for one agenda item, but uh, some interesting comments and a lot associated around those that have donated over the life of the foundation. Was their intent really for art or was it for the purposes described in the bylaws? The reality is, is when the bylaws were written, the Heritage Foundation funded the museum staff and the operations of that building. That's obviously changed. The city has done that since and has done that for some time. So. Um, and their bylaws are a little overdue for revision. I think they realize that. And they got a, an opinion from uh, their attorney, too, that said they actually thought that it could fit into the by bylaws, but that if they wanted to do something, if they did just a few tweaks, then there shouldn't be any problem with it. So, And I think that, just like you were talking about, Josh, I really think that the common sentiment is that they think it's probably a good idea. There's no other comments or that? Oh, this isn't an action item, is it? No, we just, we needed to, as the year wind down, make sure that Special. you're okay with the path we're Sorry, headed. My bad. And I would, <laughs> my bad. I would likely be presenting a contract uh, in December. Good to right, well, John. Yeah. Thanks, John. You had a resolution. That's the beard. He was ready to go. I was ready. <laughs> okay. I would say proceed. And the sounds of it, we'll bring it back. Okay, little bridges. 
it's John's turn now. Next on the agenda is the consent it's consent it's agenda. It's Mr. Brennan. Little, hold on <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. Tonight's <laughs> consent like agenda like includes item B, item A, approval of the disbursements and payroll for October, and item B, approval of the minutes of the November 1st, 2016 City Council regular meeting. All matters on the consent agenda are considered routine business by the council and will be enacted with a single motion and a single vote by roll call. There will be no separate discussion of these items. If discussion is deemed necessary, that item should be removed from the consent agenda and considered separately. Sorry. <laughs> I would entertain action. Your Honor, I would offer a resolution approving the uh, disbursement of payroll for October and the approval of the minutes from the November 1st, 2016 regular city council meeting. Second. I have a resolution by Christine Castillo, second by Allison Howe. Vote by roll call. That resolution carries unanimously. <laughs> Next public comment or audience participation. Seeing none, <laughs> reports by officials and staff. Thank you, Thank you Your Honor. Thank you. Uh, we've got a few people that probably have some announcements to make, and I'm going to ask a few people to give us some updates on a few things. But uh, I, I want to recognize Brad uh, tonight for uh, an award that we received last week from the APWA. Uh, this would be the fifth award in six years, or the fourth award in fifth, five years. I can't remember which one it is. but. Uh, we consistently in Public Works uh, do award-winning projects, and, and certain uh, members of staff hate it when I say this could be an award-winning project, but the reality is we do a lot of award-winning projects, and we're up against projects all over the state. Um, again, we won an award from the APWA for uh, the project that we did for the redoing of the Rainbow Bridge, and we were recognized by the APWA at their annual conference uh, in Arvada this year. Uh, we went last year to um, Breckenridge uh, and received another award. Uh, we, we're definitely showing a consistency in the um, level of product that we turn out when we do public works projects, and it's a direct reflection of our public works and engineering department. Uh, and I appreciate Brad for uh, his work in these projects. And I know in that situation it was also a risk management uh, project because uh, that w we got insurance money to pay for that. That was nice uh, because of the flood. So, uh, you know, it's a team effort that we put together to win these awards, but it's, it's with the American Public Works Association that, that rec has recognized us uh, five of the last six years or for the last five years, I can't remember, but consistently for the work that we do uh, and that our public works department and engineering department does. So I want to thank Brad for his work and efforts on that and everybody on the team for another great um, award that will probably uh, sit back there for many years to come for people to, um, it's not there yet, I'll bring it next week, but uh, many years to come for uh, recognition for what we do in the city of Fort Morgan. So Brad, thanks, I appreciate it. And Michael and everybody for another great uh, showing at the American Public Works Colorado Chapter um, Awards Banquet. Uh, with that, you've got the report in the, if there are any questions, uh, we've got people here that can answer those questions. Other than that, uh, I know, Josh, did you have something you wanted to bring up? And then uh, Brent, could you do a quick update on our uh, golf course uh, project when, when Josh is done? That'd be great. And anybody else that would like to? <coughs> sure, it's like, nope. <laughs> I'll leave the golf for Brent since it's a water project, but we have some work going on at Fulton Park as part of our capital improvement plan for this year and in installing our second dog park uh, over at Fulton. Um, so if any comments, questions arise there, this can be directed to my office, but uh, we should be done with that hopefully in the next couple of weeks. We're waiting on some supplies to wrap that up, but <coughs> the work's begun. And I don't know why we opened dog parks in November, but uh, the last one it was blustery cold and likely will be the same here, but uh, we're adding uh, a second. So, <laughs> Just a minute, uh, following under your department, I got uh, good feedback. The drainage area uh, off on the northeast corner of J.C. Park 
you know, where it goes down, the kind of the overflow there and everything. It's over by the beehive, and my wife recently moved her mother in there, and they were talking about how it was overgrown and wondered who was, who that belonged to. Well, it was found out it belonged to the city, and the parks department all of a sudden took over that and got it done like that as far as cleaned up. So it was something that we didn't realize was part of city, but once it was found out, the parks department, they're, they just marvel at the way they went in and cleaned that up, so. Yeah, you'll know it's part of the city the first time we get a torrential rain and that pond there fills all the way up and runs out over the road. <laughs> Uh, just a quick update. We um, last Monday we started the golf course um, supplemental irrigation project. The first phase the contractors chose to tackle was getting the pipeline through Morgan Heights. Our initial assessment was going to take them about three weeks to get through there because of all the conflicts with utilities and everything um, we had to cross. And I'm happy to report that it took them a total of four days awesome. <laughs> to get through Morgan Heights. So we have the pipeline from the ditch all the way down through Morgan Heights and it's now onto our property. So Great. the remainder of the project will just strictly be on the city property. We'll start working with Ty next week on scheduling because we will have to close some of the holes as we're doing some of the work because we can't have golfers going hit falls on top of our construction guys. <coughs> we'll work that out. Hopefully the weather will cooperate with us. We kind of would like the weather to go ahead and get bad so we can just get in there and not have to deal with a lot of that traffic. But but anyhow, we got through Morgan Heights and the road up there looks great. The contractor did an excellent job and actually, in my opinion, making the road better than it was when they started the project. And that was I think one of the concerns the county commissioners had, <coughs> they wanted to make sure that we weren't doing something that made the situation worse up there for the residents. So, so anyhow. Cool. So Brent, I've got, I've got one question for you on this and part of the reason why, I wrote it. do you think that this will be an award-winning project? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Jeff, we'll have to look at it when it's all done. It may, it may be an award-winning project. I, th I think it's got award written all over it. <laughs> Who gets it the award? Does. It has the potential. Thanks, Who Brent. Who gets the award? <laughs> That wasn't the only reason. I, 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 it's a really interesting project. It's, it is. And uh, they are doing a great job up there. And Brent updated me this morning and uh, appreciate, it, appreciate the work that they're doing out there and his oversight in that project. And you know, that was one that Brad put together at the beginning with uh, some students out of uh, CU. And when it's all wrapped up and when we get our award, we're going to invite them down and you know, <coughs> recognize them for a project they help us put together. So. I think that's it, unless there are any other questions. Yeah, I have a quick question. We haven't heard enough from Brad. I was wondering if you could just update us real quickly on Barlow and, and Platt. I'm, I've been getting questions. Brad's like, no. <laughs> They're working on it. Uh, there's an intersection project going on over there. Um, yeah. Um, the north side of Barlow is supposed to remain closed till around June. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's supposed to stay closed potentially. I know we got the schedule. John got it too. I apologize. I don't have it off the top of my head, but I believe Tuesday after Thanksgiving. Yeah, Tuesday after Thanksgiving. Um, they'll have that closed. Um, but at the rate everything goes, I would guess first of December and then everything will flip where then the south side of um, Platt Avenue will be closed for a similar duration. Now, what will start happening is we'll start seeing poles going up and those kind of elements, but um, as is normal, um, we don't really have a whole lot from the city standpoint involvement in this. We can just kind of supervise and offer recommendations as we've mentioned before. Um, they tend to have, have had to have lots of stop works due to mislocates or no locates to certain telecommunication and cable companies. So um, our utilities are where they're supposed to be, but that's usually what causes some of those stop works, so. How is truck traffic, I mean, it's been a challenge enough as it has been when they've been working on the north side. How is truck traffic gonna work on when they're on the south side? It'll actually be probably a little bit better, honestly, because most of that traffic is getting into the habit of using Mosley Road instead of sitting at that intersection. And so they're moving over road, which is immediately east. Oh, of, and then just coming and down so our... they just won't continue to the north, but it'll actually help the flow for those that are trying to get from 34 down to Walmart and the college and those. So 
it'll actually be less of a problem when when we have the south side closed i was just more thinking a lot of other areas thinking about like yeah. cargill but cargill yeah they already have they they tend to not they will sometimes but we have some restrictions on that bridge over by mcc and walmart so a lot of times the heavier equipment can't go over that anyway ah. and so a lot of those movements they'd like to use 34 so moving over a street one way or the other but it'll definitely help that i-76 traffic that likes to use barlow to get to 34 so that should we're getting a lot of calls from the businesses and a too, little less so. traffic on 8th avenue yeah exactly so <laughs> but yeah that's the, that's the latest so okay <clears throat> And we can send out more information if you need to, but we haven't heard much from their PIO department either. So, okay. Thank, Thank you. you sir. Thanks, Brad. Bids, meetings, and announcements. Mr. Brennan. Thank you, Your Honor. The city is accepting sealed proposals for wastewater treatment plant SCADA system improvements until 3 p.m. on November 18th. For Fort Morgan Police and Fire Department public safety radios until 3 p.m. on November 22nd. Uh, bids for the purchase and installation of flooring materials at the library until 2.30 p.m. on November 28th. And bids for the purchase and installation of shelving at the library until 2.45 p.m. on November 28th. <coughs> The uh, next, the Library Advisory Board meets on Monday, next Monday, the 21st at 4.30 p.m. in the Museum Community Room. All city offices will be closed next Thursday and Friday for the Thanksgiving holiday um, and Mayor's Day off. And the next City Council regular meeting will be December 6th at 6 p.m. here at City Hall. Just one quick note about uh, another road closure, Sherman Street that was closed for a couple days last week for water main break will be repaved on Thursday. So that same block, one just north of Platte Avenue on Sherman will be closed, uh, expected to be all day Thursday from about 8 a.m. until the evening. That's all I've got. Okay, Nick. Next on our agenda is an executive session for the purpose of determining positions relative to matters that may be subject to negotiation, developing strategy for negotiations, and or instructing negotiators under CSR section 24-6-4024E, and the following additional details are provided for identification purposes. Property purchased. I would entertain a motion to go into executive session. Can I make a motion that we go into executive session? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? We will adjourn. The